Please note. This movie has taken content from the Zeitgeist film series, Interreflections, and the book, The Zeitgeist Movement Defined, Realizing a New Train of Thought, and that content has been run through ChatGPT and Google Gemini using various prompts. It also contains some original prompts written by me. Zeitgeist music has also been taken and influenced by AIVA.AI, the so-called official Zeitgeist movement, and Peter Joseph's company. Gentle Machine Productions do not own the truth they have presented. The word official is actually strongly related to the word authority, yet truth should be the authority, not any individual or group. To quote the first Zeitgeist film, They must find it difficult, those who have taken authority as the truth, rather than truth as the authority. So this project asks two questions, can AI make a new Zeitgeist film? And is it possible to create a documentary that belongs to regular people who support the unofficial zeitgeist movement that is not under any copyright? Copyright in reality is a form of plagiarism. Someone is plagiarizing reality when something is put under copyright. Our reality has already allowed any combination a human can come up with. So there is no such thing as something original as everything is interconnected. There are only discoveries. There's no such thing as an invention. Reality is at odds with the basis of copyright as humans learn by copying, machines work by copying, and nature works by copying. Without copying, nature would not exist. Copyright presents a hierarchical view of reality just like religion. Yet reality is more like an open source project, where everyone learns together. Copyright is a form of oppression against the poor who wish to have free access to knowledge. The book 1984 by George Orwell explains the danger of intellectual property, where the character Winston Smith is tortured in the Ministry of Love until he accepts the false idea that 2 plus 2 makes 5, since the Ingsoc party owns 2 plus 2 makes 4. Those who burn books will in the end burn people. So enjoy. System Shift, Redesigning Societal Values. In our current societal structure driven by trade and profit, there exists an unspoken addiction to monetary gain that disrupts the prospect of fair and equal exchanges. The prevailing global mindset seems steeped in an illusion, valuing superficiality over intellect, prioritizing competition and property ownership over sharing and communal harmony. Instead of embracing sustainable practices and preservation, we endorse wasteful consumption, favoring cost efficiency over technical efficiency. The prevailing energy sources are often unsustainable and polluting, disregarding cleaner, more abundant alternatives. Moreover, the prevalence of conflict and the profiteering from warfare have overshadowed the potential for peaceful collaboration that fosters genuine progress. It's an unfortunate reality we find ourselves in, and perhaps it's time to challenge this fraudulent social paradigm that undermines our collective well-being. In the realm of contemporary psychology, a term often evoked is maladjusted, resonating with frequencies that underscore the pursuit of an idealized state of adjustment. This ubiquitous word, sought after for its promise of averting psychological complexities, propels the desire for a well-adjusted life, steering clear of neurotic and schizophrenic tendencies. Yet, within this narrative of conformity, I find myself compelled to assert that there exist facets of our society and world to which I proudly proclaim my maladjustment. I invite all individuals of goodwill to share in this maladjustment, fostering an unyielding stance until the inherent injustices and deficiencies of our societies are rectified, urging for the realization of a greater good that transcends the confines of societal norms. The essence of genuine discovery and collective progress lies in the freedom to express thoughts openly. In the marketplace of ideas, the freedom to speak and think openly serves as a sieve, letting the kernels of wisdom rise while allowing the weightless husks of flawed concepts to fall by the wayside. Only through this unbridled liberty to vocalize beliefs and challenge perspectives can the truth, 
like a beacon in the dark, emerge from the tumult of dialogue and dissent. Without this liberty, the path to enlightenment remains obscured, and the voyage toward truth becomes a labyrinth without an exit. Each time a word becomes prohibited, you remove a stone from the democratic foundation. Society demonstrates its impotence in the face of a concrete problem by removing words from the language. The book burners have nothing on modern society. The human qualities can be expressed in one word, hypocrisy. We elevate those who say right but mean wrong and mock those who say wrong but mean right. Throughout history, the backdrop of human survival was dominated by the primal forces of nature, a ceaseless battle against the elements and the wild unknown. Yet, as time charted its course, a remarkable transformation took shape. The evolution of civilization and technology conquered many of nature's adversities, granting humanity dominion over its immediate environment. However, an unforeseen shift arose, where once nature posed the gravest threat, the specter of human-created cultures now casts its shadow. The peril of today isn't merely the unrelenting force of nature, but the tangled complexities of our own societal constructs, echoing across the globe. The survival of our species is no longer besieged by the fury of the natural world, but entangled within the intricacies of how we coexist, how we treat one another, and the cultures we've nurtured. The true test of survival has become what we, as a species, are doing to each other within the constructs of our own creation. In the midst of societal decline, art serves as a mirror, reflecting the cracks and decay woven into the fabric of existence. Truthful art, in its raw and unfiltered form, doesn't shy away from showcasing the stark realities of a faltering society. It doesn't sugarcoat or hide the deterioration, instead, it bravely exposes the cracks, the imperfections, and the shadows that haunt the collective conscience. Yet, its responsibility transcends mere reflection, truthful art serves as a catalyst for change. It's not content to passively depict the world's fluctuations, rather, it aspires to be an agent of transformation, igniting conversations, challenging perceptions, and nudging society toward the path of evolution and renewal. Art's solemn duty is not only to depict the change, but to actively participate in the journey of shaping a better tomorrow. This company knew absolutely that they had a problem with the product. They knew that, that it was infected with AIDS. They dumped it because they wanted to turn this disaster into a profit. Do something for yourself. Join the Army Reserve. The Adelaide Casino. Somewhere over the rainbow is right here, and everybody's welcome to a piece of it. Find yourself in church this Sunday. Peter Popoff wants you to receive the miracle spring water to release prosperity in your life. The only question that matters is, are you hot? Nearly $33 trillion. That's what the U.S. national debt was as of early September 2023. Call me now. I'm waiting for you. Call 0055. It reckons there's about $270 billion worth of Australian home loans that are at risk of defaulting or being classified as severely stressed. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Ask the obliging Bank of America for a jar of soothing instant money. M-O-N-E-Y, in the form of a convenient personal loan. What can we do to protect ourselves from robot automation?
And there are claims that America is sponsoring terror attacks in Iran. The allegations come from a militant group's leader who was captured in Iran on Tuesday. He says he met CIA agents in Pakistan who promised to supply arms to his organization. That's a claim that Washington denies. When thinking about society and mental health, there's a curious dynamic at play. It's often perceived as positive when individuals conform or adapt well to societal norms. However, from a different perspective, this conformity might not always align with genuine mental well-being. There seems to be an inherent conflict between fitting into a society's norms and what might be truly healthy for an individual's mental state. It's like a delicate balance where being well-adjusted to societal standards doesn't necessarily equate to being mentally healthy in a society that might not foster genuine well-being for its individuals. The human pursuit of acquisition, driven by the relentless desire for more possessions and material wealth, finds a poignant analogy in the game of Monopoly. The game encapsulates the essence of this pursuit, the unending quest for accumulation, the ruthless tactics employed to gain an upper hand, and the eventual realization that all these acquisitions are ephemeral, destined to return to the box. When you accumulate properties and wealth in the game Monopoly, there is a profound lesson that transcends the confines of a mere board game. Ultimately, everything acquired in the game, no matter how much one amasses, returns to a metaphorical box. There is a futility of an existence solely defined by the acquisition of material possessions. The game, a microcosm of human existence, reflects the societal drive toward accumulation, often leading to a cycle of deception, inequality, and monopoly. In this pursuit, individuals are ensnared in a never-ending quest for more, more wealth, more properties, and more acquisitions, yet these acquisitions fail to fulfill genuine human needs. The accumulation of material possessions becomes a myopic measure of success, and the societal narrative of wealth acquisition overshadows deeper human connections and true fulfillment. The ruthless immersion into the game monopoly, mirroring the societal conditioning to relentlessly pursue wealth, unveils a stark reality. The allure of acquisition promises fulfillment, but as possessions accumulate, the ephemeral nature of materialism becomes apparent. The thrill dissipates, leaving an unsettling void that no amount of acquisitions can satiate. It prompts a crucial question, one that resonates beyond the game board, what truly matters? Beyond the ephemeral thrill of acquisition lies the quest for fulfillment rooted in genuine human connections, meaningful experiences, and a sense of purpose. The pursuit of wealth and possessions, while integral to survival, cannot be the sole measure of a fulfilling existence. Understanding that the acquisition game leads to a finite end prompts reflection on the deeper aspects that enrich the human experience, compassion, empathy, relationships, and contributions to the greater good. In essence, the pursuit of acquisitions may grant temporary satisfaction, but the enduring fulfillment lies in recognizing the transient nature of materialism and seeking meaning beyond the confines of possessions. It's in acknowledging what truly matters, our connections, our values, our contributions, that the pursuit of a fulfilling life finds its purpose. Watch the crazy shit people do for money. Money Talks. What's your price? Australia's number one show is back. Seems like your wife got a new job, and her customers pay very well. Yeah. 
You work away your life, and what does it get you? Smiles and faces? No. You get cash. Cash that can't buy back what the job takes. Not if you rode every seahorse in the world. Dad, why do I have to go to school? So you can get a job. But why do I need a job? So you can earn money. Continue ahead. But why do I need money? To buy the stuff the TV makes us want. But why do I need to buy stuff? Because if you didn't buy stuff, everyone would be out of a job and no one would have any money. Wait, so I have to work for the rest of my life to pay for stuff that I don't want just so everyone else can suffer the same horrible fate as me? Exactly. You just live your life without thinking, don't you? Jock Fresco's journey from a young rebel refusing to conform to societal norms to a visionary challenging the fundamental structures of society encapsulates a profound narrative of critical thinking, social observation, and a fervent call for change. His defiance of the status quo, rooted in a refusal to blindly conform, laid the groundwork for a lifelong exploration into the flaws inherent in societal constructs. Fresco's refusal to pledge allegiance to the flag, emblematic of his early skepticism, reflected a refusal to accept societal norms without critical examination. His dissent was not merely an act of rebellion, but a testament to his commitment to truth, refusing to subscribe to beliefs without evidence. Retreating into a self-made laboratory, Fresco embarked on a journey of self-education, delving into the realms of science and nature. His realization that the universe adheres to laws governed by science, and the recognition that human society is subject to these laws laid the foundation for his later critiques of societal structures. The turbulent times of the Great Depression and the devastation of World War II served as catalysts for Fresco's awakening. Witnessing the paradox of widespread suffering amid abundant resources and the squandering of human potential in the throes of war fueled his discontent with the established economic and social paradigms. Fresco's keen observations highlighted the absurdity of a system that allowed for such widespread deprivation while resources remained abundant. His astute calculation that the resources and efforts expended in war could have sufficed to meet global human needs showcased the stark inefficiency and irrationality of societal priorities. As he aged, his convictions remained unwavering. His disquietude stemmed from the perpetual waste of finite resources in pursuit of profit, the superficiality of materialistic values, and the grip of monetary powers over supposedly democratic structures. His unwavering call for change, echoing from the past to the present, is a stark reminder of the urgency to reassess and reconstruct societal systems. Fresco's journey embodies a relentless pursuit of truth, a fierce defiance of unjust norms, and a call for a paradigm shift towards a society guided by reason, empathy, and sustainability. His legacy urges us to challenge the entrenched systems that perpetuate inequality, exploitation, and environmental degradation. It prompts a critical evaluation of our societal values and priorities, advocating for a shift from profit-driven economies to systems that prioritize human well-being and the preservation of our planet. In essence, Fresco's impassioned plea resonates through the ages, a resounding call to discard obsolete systems and forge a new path toward a more equitable, sustainable, and humane future. His unwavering conviction that this shit's got to go echoes as a rallying cry for transformative change, inspiring us to confront the shortcomings of our current structures and work toward a world that aligns with the principles of justice, compassion, and ecological stewardship. In the vast tapestry of history, pivotal transformations have often been catalyzed by the resolute determination of a dedicated few. The collective force of a small group of individuals, driven by unwavering commitment and thoughtful action, has proven to be a catalyst for monumental change. Throughout time, these passionate advocates have ignited revolutions, challenged norms, and reshaped the trajectory of societies. 
Their profound impact echoes the belief that authentic change arises not solely from sheer numbers, but from the unwavering dedication and purposeful endeavors of a committed few, standing as a testament to the potential of human determination and unity. Part 1. The Human Being Beyond Nature versus Nurture, Embracing Complexity in Human Behavior The age-old dichotomy between nature and nurture, deeply embedded in scientific discourse, oversimplifies the intricate influences shaping human existence. This stark contrast between genetics as the deterministic root of all causality and the perspective of humans as solely social organisms devoid of biological influence perpetuates a false dichotomy. At its core, this polarized view reduces complex influences, from how a cell manages an energy crisis to shaping an individual's personality, to a simplistic binary framework. However, the reality is far more intricate and interconnected. Understanding biology necessitates acknowledging the profound interplay between genetics and the environment. It's evident that biology cannot be comprehended in isolation from its environmental context, challenging the reductionist views that isolate genetics or societal influences as exclusive determinants of human traits and behavior. The prevailing debate between nature and nurture fails to encapsulate the complexity of human existence, reflecting an oversimplified and flawed perspective. The idea that life is solely driven by DNA, dismissing environmental influences, clashes with the notion that humans are devoid of biological determinism and solely shaped by societal factors. Instead, what emerges is the inextricable link between biology and environment. This interconnectedness underscores the impossibility of isolating biology from its environmental context. Human biology doesn't exist in a vacuum, it's shaped and influenced by myriad environmental factors, underscoring the inadequacy of rigidly subscribing to either deterministic genetic perspectives or solely social influences in understanding the complexity of human biology and behavior. The misconception that human behavior is solely determined by genetics perpetuates a dangerously deterministic view of life, undermining the complexity and fluidity of human nature. This notion reduces behavior to a fixed and unchangeable outcome, anchored in genetic predispositions. It leads to a belief that societal efforts to improve or alter behavior are futile, as these traits are perceived as predestined and impervious to change. However, this deterministic perspective disregards the intricate interplay between genetics and environment, overlooking the profound impact that social, cultural, and environmental factors have on shaping human behavior. This erroneous belief in the genetic determinism of behavior not only oversimplifies the complexity of human nature, but also poses significant dangers by dissuading efforts to address and improve societal issues. It fosters a fatalistic mindset that undermines the potential for societal progress and change, dismissing the influence and adaptability of individuals within their social and environmental contexts. Embracing a more nuanced understanding that acknowledges the multifaceted influences on behavior is crucial in fostering a society that prioritizes meaningful interventions and societal improvements. The prevailing belief that conditions such as ADHD, schizophrenia, and various complex diseases are genetically predetermined is a misconception that disregards the intricate nature of genetic influence on health. Contrary to common perception, most diseases are not genetically determined but rather influenced by a complex interplay of genetic predispositions and environmental factors. While certain conditions may have a genetic component that increases susceptibility, this predisposition doesn't equate to an inevitable outcome. Diseases like heart conditions, cancers, autoimmune disorders, and mental health issues showcase this complexity where genetic predispositions exist but do not serve as absolute determinants of illness. For instance, in breast cancer, only a small fraction of women diagnosed carry the specific breast cancer genes, illustrating that the majority of cases do not have a direct genetic cause. The search for genetic origins of diseases overlooks the nuanced nature of health conditions, leading to misconceptions about genetic determinism, Diseases that are commonly attributed to genetic programming often exhibit multifaceted causative factors beyond genetics. This misconception undermines the crucial role played by environmental influences, lifestyle choices, 
and other external factors in the development of various health conditions. Understanding that genetics merely contribute to a predisposition rather than solely dictate disease occurrence is pivotal in shaping approaches to healthcare and highlighting the significance of holistic interventions that consider both genetic susceptibility and environmental influences. The complexity of genetic influence on health and behavior the notion that human behavior is solely dictated by genetic predispositions overlooks the intricate interplay between genes and environmental influences. Genes don't serve as rigid blueprints that unequivocally determine behavior, rather, they offer a spectrum of responses to environmental stimuli. Emerging research suggests that early childhood experiences and the nature of child rearing can significantly impact gene expression effectively activating or deactivating certain genes. These influences contribute to molding an individual's developmental trajectory, aligning their responses with the demands of their environment. In essence, genes don't predestine behavior, but rather offer varying responses to the environment, showcasing the plasticity and adaptability of human nature in response to external factors. The dynamic relationship between genes and the environment challenges the simplistic view that genes solely dictate behavior. Instead, genes provide individuals with different avenues for navigating and responding to their surroundings. Environmental cues and experiences can influence the expression of genes, effectively modifying an individual's developmental path. This realization underscores the complex interplay between genetic predispositions and environmental factors, emphasizing the adaptability and responsiveness of human behavior to the demands of the world in which individuals find themselves. Ultimately, this understanding highlights the multifaceted nature of human behavior, debunking the notion that behavior is rigidly predetermined by genetics and underscoring the role of environment in shaping human responses and actions. The impact of childhood abuse on the brain's genetic makeup highlights the significant role of environmental experiences in shaping genetic expression. A study conducted on suicide victims in Montreal revealed a profound correlation between childhood abuse and genetic alterations within the brain. Autopsies showed distinct genetic changes present in the brains of young adults who had suffered childhood abuse, changes absent in individuals who had not experienced such trauma. This phenomenon illustrates an epigenetic effect, wherein environmental factors, in this case, childhood abuse, trigger alterations in genetic expression. These changes at the genetic level underscore the profound influence of environmental experiences in activating or deactivating specific genes, emphasizing the intricate interplay between external factors and genetic responses within the brain. The study's findings illuminate the dynamic relationship between environmental influences and genetic expression within the brain. The term epigenetic denotes alterations occurring atop the genetic structure, showcasing how environmental factors, such as childhood abuse, can leave a lasting imprint on genetic functioning. The genetic changes observed in individuals who endured childhood abuse exemplify the significant impact of environmental experiences on gene activation or deactivation. This pivotal revelation highlights the capacity of external influences to modify genetic expression within the brain, shedding light on the intricate mechanisms through which environmental factors mold and influence brain function and development. The complex interplay of genes and environment in shaping behavior, beyond biological determinism. The Dunedin study conducted in New Zealand, tracing the lives of several thousand individuals from birth into their 20s, unveiled a nuanced relationship between genetic predisposition and violent behavior. Within this research, scientists identified a genetic mutation associated with a propensity toward violence. However, a critical revelation emerged, this abnormal gene alone did not heighten the likelihood of violent tendencies in individuals. Surprisingly, those carrying this genetic anomaly displayed a lower rate of violence compared to individuals with normal genes when not subjected to severe child abuse. This finding highlights that the presence of the abnormal gene did not independently predispose individuals to violence, rather, the crucial determinant appeared to be the interaction between this genetic factor and experiences of severe childhood abuse. 
The Dunedin Studies revelations underscore the intricate interplay between genetic predisposition and environmental factors, particularly childhood experiences of abuse, in shaping behaviors like violence. It elucidates that while certain genetic mutations may have a relationship with propensities for certain behaviors, the manifestation of these tendencies is contingent upon environmental interactions. The study challenges the oversimplified notion that genes unilaterally dictate behavior, emphasizing instead the pivotal role of environmental factors, especially childhood experiences, in influencing and modulating the expression of genetic predispositions toward violent behavior. Research involving gene manipulation in mice showcases the limitations of perceiving genes as the sole determinants of complex traits such as intelligence. By knocking out a specific gene related to learning and memory in mice, scientists observed a decline in the mice's ability to learn. This finding appeared to suggest a genetic basis for intelligence. However, what often goes unacknowledged is the pivotal role of the environment in influencing genetic outcomes. Subsequent experimentation revealed that genetically impaired mice raised in enriched, stimulating environments exhibited a remarkable reversal of their learning deficit. This critical observation underscores the profound impact of environmental factors in mitigating or even nullifying the effects of genetic impairment, challenging the conventional perception of genes as the exclusive drivers of behavior or traits. The implications of this study extend beyond the simplistic attribution of behaviors solely to genetics. It highlights the intricate interplay between genes and the environment, emphasizing that genetic contributions interact with environmental stimuli in shaping an organism's responses. This dynamic interaction underscores that genes might influence an organism's predisposition or readiness to confront specific environmental challenges rather than determining a fixed outcome. The study underscores the inadequacy of adhering to the outdated notion that behaviors or traits are exclusively governed by genetics, cautioning against the potential dangers of perpetuating such misconceptions, which echo historical contexts like eugenics and oversimplify the complexities of genetic and environmental interactions. Attributing behaviors solely to biology and genetics, while neglecting the influential role of social environments, presents significant dangers in understanding and addressing societal issues. This biological hypothesis, if accepted uncritically, poses considerable risks, fostering a perspective that absolves the responsibility of addressing social conditions that contribute to problematic behaviors. Such a viewpoint might lead to fatalistic conclusions, where individuals are seen as predetermined to exhibit violent tendencies due to their biological disposition. Consequently, this stance could rationalize punitive measures as the sole recourse, disregarding the imperative of altering social environments and the underlying conditions that foster violence. Embracing this perspective potentially overlooks the essentiality of addressing societal factors and dismissing the transformative potential of creating supportive, nurturing environments that mitigate violent predispositions. Relying solely on biological explanations for behaviors, while disregarding the influence of social contexts, can have detrimental consequences in shaping societal responses to problematic behaviors. If the focus remains fixed on genetic predispositions to violence without acknowledging the impact of social environments, it could inadvertently reinforce a mindset that favors punitive measures over proactive social interventions. This reductionist view might lead to fatalistic attitudes, negating the importance of altering societal conditions that contribute to violent behaviors. Neglecting the role of social preconditions in fostering violence could impede efforts aimed at societal reform, ultimately hindering the creation of nurturing, supportive environments that offer alternatives to punitive measures and pave the way for meaningful societal change. The legal and prison systems are often seen as the primary means of addressing crime and antisocial behavior in society. However, these systems often fail to address the root causes of such behavior, leading to a cycle of incarceration and recidivism. Societal efforts often focus on punishments like prisons and police, which are costly. However, addressing poverty, a root cause of crime, is not given enough attention or financial resources. Poverty is a pervasive issue that affects millions of individuals and families worldwide. 
It is characterized by a lack of access to basic necessities such as adequate housing, food, healthcare, and education. Living in poverty often leads to limited opportunities, social isolation, and exposure to criminogenic environments. Research has consistently shown a strong correlation between poverty and crime, as individuals struggling to meet their basic needs may resort to illegal activities as a means of survival or to escape their circumstances. To effectively address crime, it is crucial to recognize the role of poverty and other socioeconomic factors in shaping behavior. Society needs proactive solutions beyond punishment, investing in poverty alleviation, education, healthcare, and community development to address crime's root causes. Laws, often reactive, attempt to solve specific issues, but may miss broader implications or create unintended consequences due to their narrow focus and inability to address complex social problems comprehensively. The genetic fallacy, evading systemic accountability. The tendency to attribute human flaws or societal issues solely to genetics provides a convenient escape from acknowledging the deeper-rooted societal, economic, and historical factors that contribute to problematic behaviors or systemic challenges. This oversimplification often manifests as a belief that any individual dissatisfaction or antisocial conduct stems from inherent genetic flaws rather than examining the broader societal structures. The allure of the genetic argument lies in its capacity to absolve established systems, particularly capitalism, from culpability by redirecting focus onto individual genetic predispositions. This redirection allows the prevailing social, economic, and political systems to persist unchallenged, fostering an environment where systemic flaws evade scrutiny under the guise of inherent individual deficiencies. Contrasting the fallibility ascribed to human beings, the market or capitalism is often idealized as a flawless social system, shielded from critical assessment. The allure of portraying capitalism as an infallible mechanism lies in its capacity to evade scrutiny and sustain its dominant position in societal discourse. This portrayal perpetuates the belief that any dissatisfaction or discord within society is due to individual deficiencies, diverting attention away from the structural inadequacies inherent in the economic and social systems. Consequently, the systemic issues embedded within capitalism remain obscured, allowing the prevailing system to persist unchallenged and absolved from accountability for perpetuating societal challenges. The Paradox of Addiction, Societal Reverence for Destructive Behaviors Addiction, in a broader sense, encompasses any behavior marked by an intense craving, temporary relief, and long-term adverse effects, coupled with a loss of control over the behavior. While conventional notions of addiction often revolve around substances like drugs, the spectrum extends far beyond. Workaholism, compulsive shopping, gambling, excessive internet use, or immersion in video games are among the myriad behavioral addictions prevalent in society. Beyond these, there's the often overlooked addiction to power or acquisition, observed in individuals or corporations perpetually seeking more, irrespective of the detrimental consequences. Strikingly, these socially impactful addictions, causing immense harm, often receive societal endorsement and are regarded as respectable pursuits, despite their catastrophic repercussions. However, the societal perception of addiction and what is deemed respectable is paradoxical. Behaviors leading to widespread social harm, such as the addiction to power, wealth, or profit, often evade significant censure. Executives steering tobacco corporations, thriving on profit despite the fatal consequences of tobacco smoke-related illnesses claiming millions of lives annually, exemplify this dichotomy. Their addiction to profit remains untouched by legal or social consequences, their actions deemed respectable within the corporate landscape. This paradoxical acceptance of destructive addictions, glorifying pursuits that lead to societal harm, highlights a disconcerting reality where the greater the detriment caused by an addiction, the more socially revered and shielded it tends to be, creating a baffling double standard within society's perception of addiction. Unveiling the multifaceted nature of addiction, beyond inherent qualities and towards understanding susceptibility. There is no war on drugs, because you can't have a war on inanimate objects. 
There is only a war on drug addicts. Which means we are warring on the most abused and vulnerable segments of our society. The prevailing myth surrounding addiction often links the addictive nature solely to substances or specific behaviors. This misconception fuels the approach of the war on drugs, operating under the premise that by cutting off the source of drugs, addiction can be eradicated. However, a broader understanding of addiction defies this notion, indicating that no substance or behavior, in isolation, possesses inherent addictiveness. For instance, not everyone who engages in shopping becomes a shopaholic, and not every individual consuming alcohol will develop alcoholism. Instead, the crux lies in the vulnerability or susceptibility of an individual to the potentially addictive substance or behavior. The fusion of a predisposed individual with a substance or behavior with addictive potential is what facilitates the emergence of addiction, challenging the simplistic view that substances or behaviors themselves are inherently addictive. Therefore, the primary consideration in comprehending addiction rests not on the inherent addictive qualities of substances or behaviors, but on understanding the individual susceptibility factors that pave the way for addiction to take root. It's this intersection between an individual's susceptibility and the potential addictiveness of a substance or behavior that fosters the development of addiction. Addressing addiction comprehensively involves acknowledging the intricate interplay between an individual's predisposition and the environmental elements contributing to addictive behaviors, reframing the narrative from a focus solely on substances to understanding the complex dynamics involved in addiction formation. Understanding the susceptibility to addiction involves delving into the impact of life experiences on an individual's predisposition, contrary to the outdated belief in a solely genetic basis for addiction. Scientifically, the notion that addictions stem primarily from genetic causes lacks credibility. Instead, it's the culmination of life experiences that render individuals susceptible to addictive tendencies. These experiences not only mold an individual's personality and psychological needs, but also intricately shape the very structure of their brains. Remarkably, this process of susceptibility doesn't commence post-birth, but begins during fetal development in utero, emphasizing the profound impact of early environmental factors on an individual's vulnerability to addiction. Studies have underscored the profound effect of prenatal experiences on the predisposition toward addictive traits in individuals. The developmental trajectory isn't solely determined by genetic factors, but is markedly influenced by the environmental factors, particularly the psychological and social milieu in which an individual is nurtured. It's evident that the biology of human beings isn't isolated from their experiences, rather, it's substantially molded and influenced by the life experiences encountered during the crucial stages of prenatal development, emphasizing the critical role of early environmental influences in shaping susceptibility to addiction. Stress breeds addiction, addiction fuels consumption, and consumption drives profits in a market-driven society. It's a vicious cycle perpetuated by profit-seeking corporations at the expense of individual well-being and societal harmony. To break free, we must shift towards a paradigm that values holistic well-being over profit margins. Before birth and beyond, the enduring impact of prenatal experiences on human development. The impact of an environment on an unborn child begins long before their birth. As early as fetal development, the environment, predominantly influenced by the mother's physiological state, significantly shapes the unborn child's biological programming. The conditions experienced during pregnancy, including hormonal levels and nutrient availability in the maternal circulation, play a pivotal role in influencing the fetus's developmental trajectory. A poignant illustration of this is witnessed in the Dutch hunger winter of 1944, where the scarcity of food due to Nazi occupation led to starvation among many. Fetal exposure to this starvation during the second or third trimester resulted in a profound lesson for the body, prompting a perpetual adaptation in how it handles nutrients. Those fetuses, taught by starvation, tend to develop a highly conservative approach to storing sugar and fat, a characteristic that persists long after birth. Decades later, 
Individuals who experience these conditions in utero are more prone to health issues such as high blood pressure, obesity, or metabolic syndrome, highlighting how the environment in utero can significantly impact an individual's health trajectory in unexpected ways. Exposing pregnant animals to stress in a laboratory setting has revealed startling outcomes in their offspring's behavior. Studies show that stressed pregnant women have offspring with a heightened inclination toward using substances like cocaine and alcohol once they reach adulthood. This stress isn't confined to laboratory scenarios, human mothers who undergo stress during pregnancy also have discernible effects on their children. For instance, in a British study, Women who experienced abuse during pregnancy exhibited elevated levels of cortisol, a stress hormone, in their placenta during birth. Consequently, their children displayed a greater vulnerability to conditions predisposing them to addictions by the age of 7 or 8, highlighting how prenatal stress lays the foundation for various mental health issues. Further research conducted in Israel focused on children born to mothers, pregnant before the onset of the 1967 war unveiled alarming findings. These expecting mothers endured significant stress during pregnancy, which manifested in their offspring having a higher occurrence of schizophrenia compared to the average cohort. These profound outcomes emphasize the substantial impact of prenatal experiences on the development of an individual, underscoring the lasting influence of stress during the gestational period. Human brain development sets us apart significantly from many other species, particularly in terms of the timing and process of development. Unlike animals like horses that are capable of running soon after birth, humans are remarkably underdeveloped at the start of life. The reason behind this disparity lies in the evolutionary demands on our physiology. As humans evolved larger heads to accommodate the burgeoning forebrain that distinguishes our species, the pelvis simultaneously narrowed due to our bipedal locomotion. Consequently, human infants are born prematurely, necessitating post-birth brain development, which happens to a large extent under the influence of the environment. The notion of neural Darwinism sheds light on the brain's response to environmental stimuli during development. This concept underscores that brain circuits receiving appropriate environmental input tend to develop optimally, while those lacking such input may not fully develop or even regress. A striking example of this principle is observed in the visual circuits of a child. Even with perfectly functional eyes at birth, if the child is isolated in darkness for an extended period, the circuits responsible for vision will not receive the necessary light waves for development. Consequently, the initial rudimentary circuits, devoid of stimulus, may degrade, leading to lifelong blindness as new circuits fail to form without the requisite environmental input. This underscores the critical role of environmental stimuli in shaping and maintaining neural connections during early human development. Unseen Influences – The Impact of Early Experiences on Adult Behavior and Development Early experiences, particularly those beyond the recall memory stage, significantly sculpt adult behavior. While explicit memory involves the retrieval of facts and details, the hippocampus, responsible for this recall memory, doesn't fully mature until much later, rendering hardly any recall memories before 18 months. On the other hand, implicit memory, and emotional memory, operates without explicit recall, embedding emotional experiences in nerve circuits. These circuits shape responses, without direct recollection, significantly impacting behavior. For instance, individuals who are adopted often carry a lifelong sense of rejection. Though they cannot recall the adoption or separation from their birth mother due to underdeveloped hippocampal structures during infancy, the emotional memory of separation and rejection persists. Consequently, they are more prone to feeling rejected and emotionally distressed when faced with perceived rejection by others. This sense of rejection isn't exclusive to adoptees, but its potency is heightened due to the strong impact of implicit memory. Likewise, many hardcore addicts have faced significant childhood abuse or emotional loss. Their implicit memories paint a world as unsafe and untrustworthy, shaping their responses to intimacy, trust, and relationships. This perception influences their reluctance to engage in intimate connections, distrust of caregivers and professionals, and an overarching belief in an unsafe world, an outcome tightly tied to the impact of implicit memory, sometimes stemming from unrecalled incidents. 
Essential Touch, The Impact of Human Contact on Infant Development Human touch plays a fundamental role in the development of infants. Studies have revealed that premature babies benefit significantly from even just 10 minutes of being touched and stroked on their backs each day, aiding in their brain development. Touch is an essential need for infants, so much so that the absence of physical contact can have severe consequences. Infants who are not held or touched might experience detrimental effects, and in extreme cases, the lack of touch can lead to fatality. However, societal pressures often advise against picking up crying babies, advocating for uninterrupted sleep, and discouraging frequent holding, contrary to the crucial need for physical contact. This conflicting advice deprives infants of the essential comfort and care they need, potentially leading them to develop implicit memories of a world that lacks compassion and care. Ties that bind, the crucial role of childhood environment. Early experiences play a pivotal role in shaping individuals, starting from the formative years of life. These differences are profoundly rooted in the parental experiences of adversity, or ease, influencing how they interact with their children. Whether it's the manifestation of maternal depression or displaying irritability due to the challenges of their day, these experiences leave a profound impact on children's development. The effects of these encounters become deeply ingrained in children's programming, exerting significant influence on their growth. It's intriguing how this early sensitivity isn't a mere evolutionary flaw, but a common aspect observed across various species. Even in seedlings, there's an early adaptation to the environment they inhabit. For humans, this adaptation uniquely revolves around the quality of social relations. Essentially, the nurturing, conflicts, and attention received in early life offer a preview of the world children might encounter. It's a glimpse into whether they'll grow up in a competitive environment, learning self-reliance and mistrust, or in a society that values reciprocity, empathy, and cooperation. The kind of world they perceive becomes a blueprint for their emotional and cognitive development. Parenting, often unconsciously, serves as a conduit, passing on this experience to children, shaping their perception of the world they're part of. If a lot of people love each other, the world would be a better place to live. The Room, Tommy Wiseau. Childhood development, as articulated by D.W. Winnicott, hinges on two primary types of disruptions. The first encompasses traumatic and abusive events that significantly impact children's lives evident in the experiences of individuals from areas like downtown Eastside. These occurrences should not happen but unfortunately did, leaving enduring scars on those affected. However, Winnicott delves further, highlighting another critical aspect, the absence of essential nurturing experiences. This absence, labeled proximal abandonment by psychologist Alan Shore, refers to situations where children, though not subjected to overt abuse or neglect, lack the emotionally attuned and present caregiving required for healthy development. It's the absence of this emotionally available parental presence, due to societal stresses and parenting environment, that becomes a void in the lives of many children, impacting their emotional resilience and psychological well-being. The concept of proximal abandonment underscores the subtle yet profound impact of emotional availability in parenting on childhood development. It delineates a scenario where children are not necessarily facing explicit trauma, but lack consistent, emotionally responsive parenting. These children, although not abused or neglected, suffer from the absence of the essential nurturing, emotionally attuned presence of a caregiver, which is integral to their emotional and psychological growth. This absence, stemming from societal stresses and a lack of conducive parenting environments, illuminates a critical aspect of childhood development often overlooked in discussions solely centered on abuse or trauma. Dr. James Gilligan dedicated roughly four decades of his life to an unwavering pursuit, delving into the depths of human violence by engaging with society's most notorious offenders. His journey was fueled by an ardent desire to unearth the roots of violence, leading him into the confounding world of murderers, rapists, and the most violent criminals within prison walls. Through his immersive work, Dr. Gilligan uncovered a shocking reality, that the perpetrators of such extreme violence were themselves victims of unimaginable degrees of childhood abuse. 
This revelation shattered conventional understandings of what constituted child abuse, exposing the harrowing depth of maltreatment experienced by children in society. The violent individuals Dr. Gilligan encountered were not just perpetrators, they were survivors, having endured attempted murders, often inflicted by their own parents or individuals within their social milieu. Their lives bore the scars of familial and social violence, having lost their closest family members to acts of brutality committed by others. In his relentless quest to understand the causes of violence, Dr. Gilligan uncovered a profound truth, the cycle of violence was deeply entrenched within the lives of the most violent individuals he encountered. His insights underscored the lasting impact of severe childhood abuse and familial violence, offering a stark glimpse into the tumultuous environments that shaped these individuals. Through his work, Dr. Gilligan shed light on the urgent need for societal intervention, recognizing the critical role of early intervention and support in breaking the cycle of violence and abuse that perpetuated within families and communities. His dedication to comprehending the underlying causes of extreme violence brought to the forefront the imperative of addressing societal and familial dynamics to prevent the perpetuation of such distressing cycles. The Buddha's philosophical perspective emphasized the interconnectedness of everything within the universe, encapsulating the concept that each entity contains elements of the whole and is inextricably linked to its environment. This holistic viewpoint extends to human development, resonating with modern scientific insights into the biopsychosocial nature of human growth. Contemporary research, notably explored by psychiatrist and researcher Daniel Siegel at UCLA through his concept of interpersonal neurobiology, delves into the intricate relationship between human biology and its interaction with the social and psychological environment. Siegel's framework elucidates that the functioning of the human nervous system is intricately intertwined with personal relationships, primarily rooted in interactions with parental caregivers, influential attachment figures, and the broader cultural context. From infancy through adulthood and even into the twilight of life, this interconnectedness remains a cornerstone, shaping neurological functioning and development. The understanding that neurological functioning is profoundly influenced by the surrounding environment underscores the importance of the environment throughout the human lifespan. This concept illuminates that the quality of personal relationships and the broader cultural milieu significantly impact not only the development of the nervous system during infancy and childhood, but also continue to shape neurological functions in adulthood and later stages of life. It emphasizes the vital role of nurturing, supportive relationships in molding brain development, underscoring the lifelong impact of social and cultural environments on neurological functioning. This holistic perspective challenges the notion of isolating human biology from its surroundings, emphasizing the integral connection between individual development and the dynamic interplay with the environment. Understanding the Broken Windows Effect in Criminology The proliferation of graffiti, even when not obscene, confronts the subway rider with the inescapable knowledge that the environment he must endure for an hour or more a day is uncontrolled and uncontrollable, and that anyone can invade it to do whatever damage and mischief the mind suggests. The broken window effect, often referred to as the broken windows theory, is a criminological concept suggesting that visible signs of disorder and neglect in a community can lead to an increase in both petty crime and more serious criminal behavior. The theory was popularized by James Q. Wilson and George L. Kelling in 1982. It uses the analogy of a broken window in a building. If a broken window in a building is left unrepaired, it sends a signal that no one cares about the property. Consequently, this encourages further vandalism and more serious crimes, as the lack of maintenance conveys an atmosphere of lawlessness and neglect. The theory posits that the presence of disorderly and unkempt environments fosters an environment conducive to criminal activity. The broken windows theory emphasizes the importance of maintaining order and addressing minor signs of disorder and vandalism in a community to prevent more serious crimes from occurring. It suggests that by addressing small issues promptly, communities can create an environment that discourages criminal behavior and promotes a sense of order and safety. This theory has been influential in shaping policing strategies and community policing approaches in various urban settings. 
However, its effectiveness and application have been subject to debate among criminologists and policymakers. Classical music has been employed as an unconventional yet effective tool in deterring crime, resonating with the concept of the broken window effect. The theory suggests that improving the social environment can significantly reduce criminal activities. In this context, playing classical music in public spaces serves as a mechanism to elevate the ambience, signaling a sense of orderliness and care for the surroundings. It contributes to creating an environment that discourages antisocial behavior by promoting a sense of respect and civility. The presence of classical music not only enriches the atmosphere but also fosters a more positive social environment, potentially deterring potential criminal activities by invoking a sense of community pride and responsibility for shared spaces. Shifting Landscapes, Tracing Humanity's Journey from Egalitarianism to Conflict Throughout history, human societies have traversed diverse landscapes, experiencing an array of societal structures. Egalitarianism found its roots in early human societies, particularly among hunter-gatherer communities that thrived on principles of food sharing and reciprocal exchanges. These small, tightly knit groups predominantly survived through foraging, with limited hunting, fostering environments where individuals were deeply connected through kinship ties, often spanning extended families or known acquaintances. Material culture was relatively sparse, and social fluidity between groups was common, characterized by a world where interpersonal relationships and community bonds held paramount significance. This era of human existence, marked by its simplicity and close-knit social fabric, notably bore fewer traces of organized group violence, contrasting starkly with later periods of human history marked by such conflict. The question then arises, how did humanity diverge from this less violent, egalitarian existence into more contentious and organized societal frameworks? Violence within human societies exhibits immense diversity and isn't uniformly distributed across different cultures. Some societies stand as exemplars of near-absent violence, portraying remarkably low levels of aggression. Certain Anabaptist religious groups, such as the Amish, Mennonites, and Hutterites, adhere strictly to pacifism. Remarkably, among the Hutterites, there's a complete absence of recorded homicide cases, reflecting the profound commitment to nonviolence within these communities. During periods of significant conflict, like World War II, members of these groups preferred imprisonment over military service, staunchly adhering to their pacifist beliefs. In regions like the kibbutzim in Israel, characterized by exceptionally low violence levels, criminal courts sometimes employ a unique approach, sending offenders who have committed violent crimes to live in these communities. The rationale behind this unconventional measure is for these individuals to learn and adopt the non-violent lifestyle prevalent within the kibbutzim, highlighting the powerful impact of such peaceful living environments on shaping behavior. Our identities, perceptions, and even our beliefs about life are deeply influenced by the societies we inhabit. Societies encompass various facets, including theological, metaphysical, linguistic, and cultural elements, collectively shaping our views on fundamental aspects of existence. These societal influences guide our understanding of core concepts, whether life revolves around sin or beauty, whether our actions impact an afterlife, and other existential considerations. A broad distinction emerges between individualistic and collectivist societies, each fostering distinct mindsets and ideologies. For instance, in the United States, an epitome of individualism, capitalism fuels a narrative of limitless potential for upward mobility, but also correlates with diminishing safety nets. In such stratified societies, the social structure limits symmetrical, reciprocal relationships, resulting in fewer peers and instead fostering a landscape of hierarchical structures. Consequently, a society with limited reciprocal partnerships often witnesses a decline in altruistic behavior. In an individualistic society like America, the dynamics of capitalism form a stark backdrop. The promise of ascending the societal pyramid corresponds to a reduction in safety nets, a trade-off inherent in this pursuit of upward mobility. This societal structure shapes relationships characterized by differing statuses and entrenched hierarchies, 
diminishing the prevalence of symmetrical, reciprocal partnerships. As the number of peers decreases, altruism within the society diminishes, reflecting the impact of societal structures on individual behaviors and values. The emphasis on personal advancement within such systems inherently fosters a competitive ethos, limiting the space for mutual, reciprocal relationships and, subsequently, altruistic behavior within the societal framework. Understanding the nature of human beings is a complex task, one that encompasses the vast spectrum of social and behavioral variability found within our species. Despite our inherent nature, humans exhibit an unparalleled capacity for social diversity, boasting an array of beliefs, familial structures, and child-rearing practices that highlight our extraordinary adaptability. However, in societies rooted in competition and often marked by exploitation, the prevailing ideology tends to justify ruthless behavior by attributing it to an inherent, unchangeable human nature. A prevailing myth perpetuated in such societies is that humans are naturally competitive, individualistic, and inherently selfish. Yet, the reality starkly contrasts with this notion. At the core of human nature lie certain fundamental needs, needs for companionship, love, acceptance, and connection. When these needs are fulfilled, individuals tend to develop traits marked by compassion, cooperation, and empathy for others. To truly understand human nature, one must acknowledge the existence of these fundamental human needs that profoundly shape our traits and behaviors. The concrete expression of human nature emerges from the fulfillment or deprivation of these needs. The innate requirement for connection and acceptance leads to the development of compassionate and cooperative traits when these needs are met. Conversely, when individuals face a deficit in having their fundamental needs fulfilled, a distortion of human nature emerges, manifesting as traits contrary to their intrinsic potential. This disparity between innate needs and the actualized traits observed in society underscores the profound impact of unmet human needs in shaping behaviors and societal dynamics. Understanding the human organism's adaptability to diverse conditions and its inherent need for positive environmental stimuli while guarding against detrimental influences highlights a crucial societal responsibility. Just as the body relies on essential nutrients, the human brain requires constructive inputs for development, and the absence of such conditions may lead to physical and mental illnesses, as well as detrimental behaviors. This introspective examination prompts us to question whether our current socioeconomic system truly supports human health and social progress or hinders the fundamental evolutionary requisites for individual and communal well-being. Scrutinizing the contemporary societal landscape reveals a need to assess its alignment with the essential requirements for human health and societal advancement raising concerns about whether our societal framework adequately fosters environments conducive to meeting these critical human needs. Intermission The prevailing trading system often promotes an idealistic view of fairness and equality in transactions, but this notion is sharply refuted. Instead, trading, at its core, operates under the guise of equality while covertly fostering deception to secure a better outcome for one party. This system perpetuates a cycle of hidden coercion, effectively enforcing a monopolistic environment that inherently undermines public health for both affluent and marginalized segments of society. In this realm, politics merely emerges as a facade layer to top the trading structure, rendering the notion of influencing change through economic participation futile in the larger scheme. The semblance of fairness and equality in trading is a veil concealing a subtle conspiracy, sowing seeds of disparity and inequality rather than fostering genuine equity. The pervasive issues within our societal fabric are not a product of inherent human nature but rather stem from widespread ignorance and unwavering blind adherence to established norms. While trading ostensibly upholds principles of exchange, it subtly embodies qualities reminiscent of organized crime. The mechanics of trade, inherently embedded with deceptive elements, perpetuate a system that thrives on clandestine agendas and perpetuates societal challenges. Acknowledging this fundamental distortion within the trading paradigm is pivotal in addressing the root causes of social disparities and fostering a more equitable and just societal structure. Part 2 
Free Market Capitalism Consider the intricate nature of freedom and its illusion. There's a curious irony in the idea that sometimes, individuals who believe they possess absolute freedom might unknowingly be confined by their own convictions. The illusion of liberty, when mistaken for actual autonomy, can lead to a profound sense of entrapment. It's a reminder of the complexity inherent in understanding true freedom, suggesting that perceived independence might conceal underlying limitations or constraints. This concept hints at the deeper layers within the human psyche, where the perception of freedom might differ vastly from the actual reality of it. It's all about money, not freedom. If you think you're free, try going somewhere without money, okay? The love of money is the root of all evil. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Do you want to make some money? The misconception of the money sequence of value, how economic theory overlooks the true drivers of well-being. The origins of our current economic system can be traced back to John Locke's introduction of the concept of property. Locke's theory of property included three conditions, that there must be enough left over for others, that it must not be allowed to spoil, and that it must be mixed with one's labor. Initially, Locke presented a compelling argument for private property, but he later abandoned these provisos when he introduced the concept of money. This led to a significant shift, as money became a means to acquire property, regardless of whether it was earned through labor or not. Adam Smith further developed Locke's ideas by introducing the concept of the invisible hand of the market. According to Smith, the market would naturally regulate itself to achieve equilibrium between supply and demand. This notion essentially deified the market, as it was now seen as an autonomous entity that would ensure the efficient allocation of resources. Smith also believed that the poor would be limited by the scarcity of subsistence and that nature would deal with this by eliminating their children. This callous view of the poor highlighted his blindness to the immense suffering caused by poverty and inequality. The ideas of Locke and Smith have had a profound impact on modern economics and society. Their theories have contributed to the rise of capitalism and the belief in the self-regulating nature of the free market. However, the flaws in their theories, such as the lack of consideration for social justice and the environment, have led to many of the problems we face today, including inequality, poverty, and ecological destruction. Adam Smith, the father of modern economics, proposed the concept of the free market based on the exchange of tangible goods necessary for survival. However, the rise of financial trading, where money is made solely by moving money, has diverted the focus of economic activity away from tangible goods. This shift is rooted in Smith's treatment of money as a commodity, but it has led to the pursuit of money for its own sake, detached from its productive value. The pursuit of financial gain, driven by the money sequence of value, has become the primary economic motivator in virtually every economy worldwide, regardless of their social system. This has overshadowed the foundational life sequence of value, which emphasizes the well-being of individuals and society. The result is a situation where economic activity is dominated by financial transactions and speculative investments, often at the expense of the real economy and societal well-being. The decoupling of the money sequence of value from the foundational life sequence of value has led to a profit-oriented mindset that disregards social and environmental responsibility. This has contributed to a system where economic success is measured solely in terms of financial gain, often at the expense of sustainable development and the well-being of future generations. Relining the focus back to the life interest is crucial for creating an economic system that prioritizes societal needs and fosters true progress. God doesn't make the world this way. We do. Economic doctrine has been muddled by a fundamental misunderstanding, the belief that the money sequence of value directly leads to the life sequence of value. This misconception arises from the notion that increased sales, rising gross domestic product, and other economic indicators automatically translate into enhanced well-being, leading to the assumption that GDP can serve as a reliable barometer of societal health. This confusion stems from the conflation of the money sequence of value, which encompasses monetary transactions and revenues from goods sold, with the life sequence of value, which represents the processes that sustain and enhance life. By conflating these two distinct sequences, economic theory has built in a fundamental flaw that becomes increasingly perilous as the money sequence of value becomes detached from actual value creation. Economics is not a science. 
this systemic disorder has dire consequences. As the money sequence of value diverges from the production of tangible value, it transforms into a self-perpetuating cycle of financial transactions that no longer reflect genuine economic activity. This decoupling leads to a situation where economic growth and financial gains are achieved without a corresponding increase in well-being or sustainability. In essence, the current economic system suffers from a structural flaw that renders it both unsustainable and detrimental to societal well-being. This systemic disorder poses a significant threat and demands urgent attention and fundamental restructuring. The insanity of our economic system, prioritizing profit over well-being, sustainability, and justice. In today's society, we often rely on economic indicators like GDP, CPI, and stock market value to measure our progress. However, these measures do not accurately reflect the well-being, happiness, trust, or social stability of a society. They only measure the flow of money and do not provide any insight into the quality of people's lives. Take GDP, for instance. Often touted as a measure of national prosperity, it simply reflects the total value of goods and services produced. Yet GDP does not differentiate between goods and services that contribute to our well-being and those that do not. For example, the GDP would increase if we spent more money on healthcare, even if it meant that people were getting sicker. This is because healthcare spending is counted as a positive contribution to the economy, regardless of whether it actually makes people healthier or not. GDP, CPI, and other economic indicators are important tools for measuring certain aspects of a country's economy. However, they do not provide a complete picture of our progress. To truly understand the well-being of our society, we need to look at a wider range of indicators, including measures of health, happiness, trust, and social stability. You have to create problems to create profit. The current economic system prioritizes profit generation over societal well-being. Saving lives, maintaining ecological balance, promoting justice and peace off a little financial gain within this paradigm. The saying, pass a law and create a business, epitomizes this mindset, as laws often lead to business opportunities, such as the proliferation of lawyers. Similar to how crime creates business, destruction in Haiti has resulted in lucrative opportunities. The United States incarceration rate reflects this profit-driven approach, with approximately 2 million people imprisoned. Private corporations, such as Corrections Corporation of America and Wackenhut, operate many of these prisons and profit from incarcerating individuals. Their stock prices rise based on the number of inmates, highlighting the perverse incentives of the system. This situation serves as a chilling illustration of how the current economic paradigm prioritizes profit over human welfare. It is crucial to challenge this paradigm and explore alternative economic models that prioritize human well-being, environmental sustainability, and social justice. Only then can we create a society that values life, balance, and justice over profit maximization. The global market system is built on the continuous flow of consumption to maintain its functionality. The three main actors in this system are the employee, the employer, and the consumer. Employees sell their labor to employers, who produce goods and services that are purchased by consumers. In order for the system to continue operating, there must be sufficient demand for goods and services to generate income for each of these actors. In theory, an economy is designed to be efficient and minimize waste. However, our current system, with its emphasis on consumption, promotes the opposite. It encourages the rapid depletion of finite resources, such as oil and minerals, which took millions or billions of years to form. This approach, known as ecocidal insanity, leads to the destruction of the environment and is unsustainable in the long term. The intent of the market system is to maximize consumption, not to preserve or economize. This is inherently at odds with the true purpose of an economy, which should be to efficiently allocate resources for producing and distributing essential goods that support life. Therefore, we need to shift our focus from promoting consumption to promoting efficiency and sustainability. This means developing a system that minimizes waste, conserves resources, and operates in harmony with the natural world. We need an economy that truly economizes. It's alarming how wasteful our current system is. Every level of life organization, from ecosystems to social programs and water access, faces crisis, challenge, decay, or collapse. Scientific research consistently supports this notion of widespread decline. 
it's almost impossible to name a life form that isn't threatened or endangered. This realization can be overwhelming, leading to feelings of despair. Unfortunately, we have yet to fully comprehend the underlying mechanisms responsible for this pervasive decline. It's as if we are afraid to confront the root causes, choosing instead to continue our current practices despite their clear ineffectiveness. This denial of reality borders on insanity, as we persist in repeating actions that evidently do not yield positive outcomes. It is clear that we are not dealing with a functional economic system. In fact, one could argue that it's an anti-economic system, given its inherent wastefulness and destruction. Our current approach is unsustainable, and we urgently need to find alternative systems that prioritize efficiency, sustainability, and the well-being of all life forms. Recognizing the extent of the crisis is the first step towards finding solutions. We must educate ourselves, challenge assumptions, and embrace innovative thinking. It's essential to collaborate across disciplines and perspectives to develop truly sustainable and regenerative systems. By working together, we can create a future where waste is eliminated and all life can thrive. The Economics of Obsolescence, Unveiling the Inherent Contradictions of Market-Driven Consumption In the competitive market ideology, the pursuit of the best possible goods at the lowest possible prices underpins the rationale for market competition, assuming that competition naturally yields higher quality products. Logically, if one were to construct a chest of drawers from scratch, it would be fashioned from durable, top-notch materials for long-lasting use. However, within the market domain, such rationality isn't just unfeasible, it's inconceivable. It becomes mathematically impossible to produce the most advanced, efficient, and sustainable products because the competitive market necessitates cost efficiency at every stage, from labor to materials. This inherent cost-cutting strategy results in what can be termed as intrinsic obsolescence, ensuring that everything produced is immediately inferior, sustaining a cyclical consumption pattern. Amidst this, a deeper and lesser-known principle governs market economics, nothing produced can outlast cyclical consumption. This notion propels the strategy of planned obsolescence, a deliberate design to ensure products break down, expire, or become obsolete within a specific time frame. Corporations obscure this strategy within the phenomenon of intrinsic obsolescence while dismissing potentially sustainable technological advancements. Planned obsolescence ensures that longer-lasting goods are counterproductive for the market system, directly linking product sustainability to economic growth's inverse. The glaring reality underscores the system's inefficiency, landfills cluttered with short-lived electronic gadgets, laden with precious yet difficult to mine materials, discarded due to minor malfunctions or obsolescence. Despite the potential for repair or upgrades, economic efficiency contends against such practicalities. Sustainability, preservation, and efficiency emerge as adversaries to the economic system, evident in a sea of wasteful landfills, a stark illustration of the system's operational reality in stark contrast to physical, finite resources. The implications extend beyond material goods into the service industry, where there's no monetary incentive to resolve existing issues. The medical field, for instance, doesn't financially benefit from curing diseases like cancer, which would reduce jobs and revenues. Similarly, within the system's parameters, crime, terrorism, and war industries are economically viable. Crime perpetuates employment in law enforcement and generates revenue from security and privately owned prisons. Also the war industry, notably in America, thrives on production for destruction and reconstruction, a profitable cycle witnessed in events like the Iraq War, where billion-dollar contracts fueled economic growth despite societal losses. The paradox surfaces in the rise of GDP, often indicating an increase in necessity, contrived or real, resulting inherently in inefficiency. Increased necessity directly correlates to increased inefficiency, perpetuating a system where economic sustenance thrives on environmentally detrimental attributes, fostering a stark contradiction between economic sustainability and social good. A shooting war is better for business. Which is more obscene? Sex or war? Why is it that there is a gun shop on almost every corner in this community? I'll tell you why. For the same reason that there is a liquor store on almost every corner in the black community. Why? They want us to kill ourselves. Manufactured desires, the consumer culture conundrum. 
The American dream, heavily reliant on consumerism, is deeply entrenched in the fabric of society. Mainstream media and commercial advertising play pivotal roles in perpetuating this ethos, promoting an insatiable desire for material possessions as the cornerstone of happiness. However, the truth lies far from this narrative. Despite the mounting evidence against the fulfillment found in material wealth, people continue to adhere to this ideology, leading to ecological repercussions. This adherence isn't merely a choice but a result of systematic conditioning, classical and operant conditioning methods intricately woven into advertising strategies. Companies boast about their ability to embed brand consciousness even in infants, shaping consumer behaviors from an incredibly young age. This manipulation of values and desires is a reflection of a societal disorder, fostering a distorted perception of fulfillment and contentment. The malleability of the human mind is showcased in the world of commercial advertising. People, influenced by environmental stimuli and reinforced messages, become conditioned to consume. The concept of status, often associated with certain brands, drives consumers to spend exorbitant amounts on products that may have minimal intrinsic value. Traditional communal traditions, fostering trust and cohesiveness, have been reshaped by acquisitive materialistic values. The annual exchange of useless items during holidays exemplifies this shift. Compulsive shopping and acquisition become common when societies condition individuals from childhood to associate material goods with status among peers and family. The foundation of any society rests on its values. In our current societal structure, conspicuous consumption is essential for the continuation of the market system. This drives corporations to invest heavily in advertising, prioritizing the creation of false needs over the production of products. The consumer culture we witness today is a manufactured construct designed to drive higher levels of consumption. Corporations exploit this by spending more resources on advertising than on product creation itself. They successfully manipulate consumers into feeling the need to fill these manufactured gaps, perpetuating the cycle of consumption. When you're born into this world, you're given a ticket to the freak show. And if you're born in America, you get a front row seat. Anything I can help you with? Yes, I'm looking for clothes so expensive only an idiot would buy them. Oh, there they are. If we understand the mechanism and motives of the group mind, it is now possible to control and regiment the masses according to our will without them knowing it. Deception and Devotion, Unmasking the Scam of Religion In today's market-driven society, the relentless pursuit of profit and efficiency creates an environment ripe for scams to proliferate. With its focus on maximizing gains and minimizing costs, the market system inadvertently fosters a culture where individuals are drawn to the promise of quick riches. Scams capitalize on this desire for rapid wealth accumulation, presenting themselves as attractive opportunities for those seeking immediate financial success. Within this landscape, scams find fertile ground to thrive, exploiting loopholes and vulnerabilities in the system to generate substantial profits in remarkably short periods. As a result, the allure of quick wealth perpetuates a cycle of deception and exploitation, undermining trust and integrity within the market framework. Although money and trade are a religion, the well-known religions of the world are the greatest scams on earth, they rely on deception to exist. Religion is a for-profit business. God is all-powerful yet is still weak enough that he needs money. Yet even when a religion isn't about making money, it is definitely about oppression and control through lies. If it's not someone oppressing you directly it's about punishing yourself with superstitious blind belief. This brainwashing serves as a distraction from obtaining world peace. The concept of God is actually a contradiction in logic. In the Bible, God is described as an entity which speaks, while simultaneously is everywhere or omnipresent. So God actually mirrors the Santa Claus superstition that is told to children. Religion embraces repulsiveness and also has a focus on death worship with a focus on what happens after you die and afterlife being more important than your life, because again, religion is mind control. Hence religion is fear-based not love-based like true science is. A religion is born out of poverty and ignorance so it can only promote poverty and ignorance. Religion will use the truth as bait. 
it will say something truthful like, love and fear cannot coexist. Yet you have to wonder what kind of love they are talking about when religious people kill people who either don't conform, or kill people because of a superstitious reason. In India they believe ingesting cow dung and cow urine has medical benefits. There is no scientific evidence to support this claim. So religion is deceptive, insane, shit. A religious person will do mental gymnastics and say things like, just because someone like Peter Popoff is proven to be a scam, this doesn't prove God doesn't exist. Scam artists like Peter Popoff will be punished in hell. Well it actually does prove God doesn't exist. Such a statement shows a misconception about reality. The scientific reality is that fire needs a fuel to burn. According to some sources, the character Jesus Christ might have come from older beliefs, possibly from the Egyptian god Horus. The Christian religion is a parody on the worship of the sun, in which they put a man called Christ in the place of the sun, and pay him the adoration originally paid to the sun. But more blatantly obvious is that Jesus Christ is copied from the Old Testament, from the character Joseph mentioned in Genesis. This is considering the 60 similarities between Joseph and Jesus. The stories are different but there are similarities between the stories in artistic or creative ways. To quote George Lucas, it's like poetry, they rhyme. The reason it's written in a particular way or copied from the Old Testament is because whoever wrote it knew what works and what doesn't regarding manipulating people. In George Orwell's dystopian novel 1984, Winston grapples with forbidden love for Julia, a fellow rebel. Their passion defies the oppressive regime of Big Brother, which seeks to control every aspect of their lives. However, as the story unfolds, Winston's love is crushed, and he is coerced into adoring Big Brother, an emblem of the totalitarian state. This haunting transformation mirrors the psychological torment faced by heterosexual men who are pressured to embrace religious dogma, even if it conflicts with their true feelings. The parallel between Winston's fate and the enforced devotion to Jesus underscores the power dynamics inherent in both political and religious systems where love can be weaponized or manipulated to maintain control. Some people hearing that statement will have a knee-jerk reaction and claim I'm against homosexuality, but to make things clear, I'm against the use of torture to control people. The irony of religion is while it has homosexual themes like wanting heterosexual men to love Jesus, they are also against homosexuality. So religion is perfected mind control as it promotes cognitive dissonance. Religion is about oppression, plain and simple. You're not allowed to eat meat on a certain day because you must punish yourself pointlessly and make a meaningless, superstitious sacrifice to Buddha. If someone draws Muhammad, they must be eliminated. If someone criticizes Scientology, Scientologists must attack their critics. Also religious scams have official websites, and the word official is strongly related to the word authority. A religion will present a hierarchical view of reality, which is in line with the concept of copyright. So the Book of Mormon and Scientology's book, Diantics are under copyright. The so-called sacred apparently needs legal, intellectual property protection. To this day I find it remarkable that anybody even at the most remote podunk field office of the FBI thought that a fitting use for taxpayer dollars was investigating people for criminal theft on the grounds that they had made the law public. How can you call yourself a lawman and think that there can possibly be anything wrong in this whole world with making the law public? Lighthouses are more useful than churches. Religion can never reform mankind because religion is slavery. Religion is politics. There is no humor in religion because they are under the impression that they must take nonsense seriously. Terms like, scientism, the idea that science is a religion, are terms used by religious people in an attempt to discredit the scientific method. And those people who try to discredit the scientific method will ironically use a device made by science to do that. The law of the Lord is a perfect scam. Soulless aesthetics, the market's grip on artistic expression, in a market-driven world, aesthetics often bow to cost efficiency, yielding an abundance of ugly art, architecture, and music. Yet, amidst this sea of soullessness, we find resistance in the form of graffiti, a voice against uninspired structures. The prevalence of unconventional art questions the market's grasp on beauty, favoring contemporary tastes over timeless resonance. However, the essence of art lies not in mere aesthetics but in its ability to enrich and inspire. Ugly art, lacking in depth, reflects a system that prioritizes profit over the profound impact of artistic expression.
the consequences of profit-driven economic philosophy, human suffering and neglect of life-sustaining needs. Economists are often perceived as experts in the realm of finance, but in reality, their primary focus lies in promoting the concept of monetary value. Their models and theories revolve around token exchanges that prioritize profit, neglecting the actual processes and mechanisms that drive economic growth and societal well-being. This narrow perspective leads to a disconnect between economic models and the real world, where factors such as production, labor, and resource allocation play a crucial role in shaping economic outcomes. In a question and answers interview, Milton Friedman said, regarding a man who died because he didn't have the money to pay his electricity bill, the following quote. The responsibility really lies not on the electric company for turning it off but on those of this man's neighbors and friends and associates who were not charitable enough to enable him, as an individual, to meet the electric bill. Milton Friedman's perspective seems detached from the human consequences of a profit-driven system. His assertion that the responsibility for the death of the man who couldn't pay his electric bill lies with the community for not being charitable enough reflects a cold, utilitarian outlook that places the burden on society rather than the institution directly involved. His stance embodies a belief in individualism to an extreme, placing the onus of survival solely on the shoulders of those nearest, rather than questioning the ethics of a system that prioritizes profit over human life. This attitude ignores the structural inequalities perpetuated by profit-driven businesses, where vulnerable individuals become casualties of a system that values financial gain above humanitarian concerns. It highlights a troubling facet of business culture where compassion and social responsibility are often overshadowed by profit motives, leaving many vulnerable individuals at the mercy of market forces and social safety nets that are fundamentally flawed and inadequate. Poverty, inequality, and a lack of access to nutritious food are the root causes of why every five seconds, a child somewhere in the world dies from hunger and malnutrition. The philosophies embraced by market economists reflect a deep-seated belief system that operates akin to religious doctrine. Their theories, revolving around the primacy of financial transactions and economic principles, create a self-contained discourse that revolves primarily around monetary considerations. This closed cycle encompasses intricate economic analyses like consumption patterns, fiscal policies, and demand models while overlooking fundamental aspects such as human needs, environmental conservation, and the crucial imperative of nurturing life-sustaining systems. Instead, these economic ideologies adamantly assert that individuals, primarily motivated by self-interest and the pursuit of financial gain, inherently lead to a self-regulated and harmonious society. Despite the evident gaps in accounting for scientific realities and the broader dynamics of societal and ecological well-being, this paradigm persists with a zealous fervor reminiscent of religious conviction. The dominant economic theory lacks any consideration for the well-being and needs of individuals. It prioritizes the pursuit of self-interest and the accumulation of money above all else. Social relations, natural resources, and the family unit are only relevant insofar as they contribute to the maximization of individual gains. Human needs are reduced to mere wants that can be satisfied through market transactions, irrespective of whether those wants align with basic necessities or frivolities. This narrow focus on monetary transactions and self-maximization leads to a distorted and incomplete understanding of the economy's role in society. It ignores the broader social and environmental implications of economic activities and fails to address the fundamental issue of meeting human needs. This limited perspective perpetuates a system that prioritizes material wealth over human well-being and sustainability. The monetary system, a debt-fueled Ponzi scheme on a finite planet. The market system involves individuals engaging in various economic activities, such as labor production and distribution, primarily driven by the pursuit of profit. In contrast, the monetary system represents a set of policies established by financial institutions that influences the conditions of the market system. This system encompasses terms like interest rates, loans, debt, money supply, and inflation, which are often discussed by monetary economists. Despite the complexity and jargon associated with the monetary system, its underlying nature is relatively simple. Three fundamental elements govern the global economy, fractional reserve banking, compound interest, and an infinite growth paradigm. Fractional reserve banking allows banks to create money through lending, while compound interest requires borrowers to pay back more than they originally borrowed. This process leads to the creation of additional money, which must be serviced by further money creation. 
the prevailing economic paradigm can be characterized as a Ponzi scheme where continuous growth is essential for its survival. However, such perpetual growth is not feasible in the context of a finite planet. James Hillman, a renowned psychologist, observed that in the human body, only cancer grows after a certain age. This analogy highlights the inherent limitations to growth. The relentless pursuit of economic growth places a heavy burden on individuals who are essentially seen as vehicles for money creation. This cycle requires constant borrowing and money creation to maintain its stability. However, the current global economic crisis underscores the fragility of this system and its inability to sustain infinite growth on a finite planet. The monetary system is fundamentally underpinned by debt, a reality that shapes the entirety of the economy. Money, in its essence, originates from debt, whether in the form of bonds, loans, or credit transactions. This monetary creation tied to debt establishes a unique scenario where if all outstanding debt were instantly repaid, there wouldn't exist a single dollar in circulation. Additionally, interest charged on loans compounds this problem as the money required to settle the interest doesn't exist in the money supply but is necessary to cover the interest charges, inevitably leading to an ever-increasing money supply and, consequently, inflation. The entire world economy rests on the consumer. If he ever stops spending money he doesn't have on things he doesn't need, we're done for. If there were no debts in our money system, there wouldn't be any money. Each and every time a bank makes a loan, New bank credit is created, new deposits, brand new money. Banking doesn't involve fraud, banking is fraud. Only commercial banks and trust companies can lend money that they manufacture by lending it. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. The study of money, above all other fields in economics, is one in which complexity is used to disguise truth or to evade truth, not to reveal it. The process by which banks create money is so simple that the mind is repelled. The issue which has swept down the centuries and which will have to be fought sooner or later is the people versus the banks. Permit me to issue and control the money of a nation, and I care not who makes its laws. Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. This system's dynamics inevitably lead to inflation and bankruptcy. The perpetual increase in the money supply to cover interest charges invariably causes inflation, a trend witnessed globally. Moreover, bankruptcy looms over individuals, businesses, and even countries, arising when interest payments become insurmountable. However, within this scenario, the system is rigged to favor corporations and those in power. Debt effectively creates a workforce entrapped in financial obligations, making them more likely to accept low wages, turning individuals into easily exploitable resources for corporations. And I said, look, um, we'd like to ask you to work for us for 50 cents a year, and uh, if you would uh, uh, devote uh, at least uh, you know, uh, 20 hours a week. This same concept extends to countries where global entities like the World Bank and the IMF offer significant loans at high interest rates, eventually exerting control and exploitation when nations fall into insurmountable debt. The stock market serves as a unique amalgamation of the monetary and market systems, deviating from the tangible production of goods and services. Instead, it operates by buying and selling money itself, even trading debt for profit. Complex financial instruments like credit default swaps and collateralized debt obligations further compound this issue, allowing for the commodification and manipulation of debt for financial gain. The interconnectedness between the stock market, Wall Street, and the monetary system has birthed an unprecedented level of irrationality and instability within the economy, showcasing a distorted version of value driven by the money sequence. The editorial, Lessons of the Brain-Damaged Investor, sheds light on a disturbing reality within Wall Street and the financial markets. It outlines how individuals with diminished empathy, often due to slight brain damage, perform better as investors. This detachment from empathy allows for decisions and trades to be executed without consideration for their impact on fellow human beings. 
Consequently, Wall Street fosters a culture that breeds individuals lacking in empathy, transforming them into robotic traders devoid of ethical concerns or moral considerations. To exacerbate this trend, financial institutions now opt for algorithmic trading, employing computerized systems that engage in high-frequency trading. These systems, exemplified by Goldman Sachs' collocated computer, engage in trading strategies that exploit minute price differences, reaping immense profits through tactics that, statistically, seem impossible. The pervasive culture of corruption within Wall Street and financial institutions perpetuates fraudulent practices as the norm rather than an exception. Bribes flow upward within the hierarchy, from brokers to compliance officers, ultimately facilitating an environment where compliance with the law becomes a transactional affair. Compliance officers, tasked with ensuring adherence to regulations, can be influenced or manipulated, making adherence to the law a matter of circumstantial compliance rather than ethical obligation. Fraud, once considered an incidental issue within the system, has now become its very foundation. Financial institutions engage in the trading of fraudulent claims, generating profits and bonuses through the circulation and resecuritization of these fraudulent assets, which have no real value or likelihood of ever being repaid. This systemic acceptance and promotion of fraudulent activities have transformed them into the driving force behind the United States' economic growth, despite the inherent risks and lack of substance in these transactions. The staggering scale of outstanding fraudulent claims, particularly derivatives, within the global financial system presents an alarming predicament. With an estimated value surpassing $700 trillion, this sum far exceeds the entire planet's gross domestic product by more than tenfold. The repercussions of this financial entanglement have already manifested in government bailouts of corporations and banks, an irony given that these bailouts often involve governments borrowing funds from the very institutions they seek to rescue. Now, attempts are underway to bail out entire countries, orchestrated by conglomerates of nations through international banks. However, the enormity of the problem poses a critical question, how does one bail out an entire planet? Nearly every country is ensnared in debt, and the chain reaction of sovereign debt defaults appears to be only at its onset, considering the staggering arithmetic. The trajectory seems dire as economists predict an ominous future where income taxes in the United States may need to skyrocket to a staggering 65% per person just to cover the impending interest payments. Projections paint a bleak picture, hinting that within a few decades, a staggering 60% of the world's countries might face bankruptcy. Astonishingly, the looming global financial crisis is founded upon an intangible concept, debt, an abstract construct invented within the financial realm. Well, honey, I've extended our line of credit and exhausted all our savings. We should be good for another month. Oh, that's great, honey. Well, what are we going to do next month? Well, I'll tell you what we're not going to do. Shoot all of our children and then kill ourselves. <laughs> oh, I'm going to hold you to that. I don't think you'll have any control over it. Yet, the repercussions of this monetary fiction are felt tangibly, impacting billions of lives worldwide. The consequences are stark, soaring unemployment rates, burgeoning tent cities, escalating poverty, the imposition of austerity measures, closure of educational institutions, widespread child hunger, and various forms of deprivation among families. All these distressing realities have emerged due to a systemic financial crisis rooted in a complex web of financial maneuvers, prompting a rhetorical question, in light of this elaborate and catastrophic fiction, does this not reflect a collective misjudgment? Yo Earth, what's with the long face? Oh hey Mars, I'm just, you know, struggling with some stuff. Same old, same old. You're gonna ask for a favour again, aren't you? Uh, well, you see... Alright, what's this? Earth, you better not be here begging for resources again. Look, I know I've been a little careless lately, but... No buts! You're always making things designed to break, making a mess, and then expecting us to bail you out. Grow up, man. Earth, you've got to start taking care of yourself. You know you've got plenty of resources. You've just got to use them more wisely instead of mindlessly consuming them. Yeah, I know. I just need a little help. Well, you're not going to exhaust all our resources too, so we're cutting you off. Come on, guys. Wait, guys, come on. I can change. I promise. I'll give up the market as soon as I've made enough profit to retire on. 
the corrosive consequences of inequality, how the monetary market paradigm impacts public health and societal well-being. The market system, with its inherent tendency towards monopoly and wealth consolidation, and the monetary system, with its built-in class division, have created a profound consequence, inequality. This inequality manifests in various ways, from the disproportionate wealth of top hedge fund managers compared to scientists or healthcare workers, to the structural classism embedded in the monetary system, where individuals with savings can earn interest without contributing socially, while those who rely on loans end up paying interest that enriches the wealthy. Historically, social stratification has been accepted as a norm, with the top 1% of the population owning a significant portion of the world's wealth. However, beyond material fairness, inequality has a detrimental impact on public health. The social and economic disparities created by inequality lead to unequal access to healthcare, education, and healthy living conditions, contributing to a decline in overall public health. The monetary market paradigm, which combines the market and monetary systems, has exacerbated inequality and its negative consequences for public health. This paradigm has created a system where wealth is concentrated in the hands of a few, while the majority of the population struggles to meet basic needs. This disparity in wealth and resources leads to disparities in health outcomes and a decline in overall public health. The unsettling contrast between the immense material success of societies and the pervasive social failings has sparked considerable bewilderment. Despite unprecedented wealth, societal indicators reveal a darker narrative marked by escalating rates of drug abuse, violence, self-harm among youths, and a surge in mental health issues. This stark discrepancy unveils a profound truth, that inequality isn't merely divisive but deeply corrosive to social fabric. The empirical evidence corroborates a long-standing intuition, inequality fosters detrimental psychological and social ramifications. It seems to breed sentiments of superiority and inferiority, fostering a schism where those at the bottom feel disrespected and marginalized. This degradation of self-worth is linked to the higher prevalence of violence in more unequal societies, where disrespect becomes a potent trigger for aggressive behavior. The paramount principle emerging from this data is the pivotal role of equality in curbing violence. It stands as the linchpin for preventing violent behaviors within societies. The degree of equality versus inequality emerges as the primary factor shaping the prevalence of violence. The more egalitarian a society, the lower the propensity for violent tendencies among its populace. This foundational principle underlines the indispensable link between social equality and the prevention of violence, emphasizing the urgency of addressing disparities to safeguard societal well-being. The empirical realities substantiate the interconnectedness between societal inequalities and the alarming surge in social maladies. The data echoes the sentiment that pervasive inequalities breed a climate ripe for social unrest, marked by feelings of disrespect and inferiority. In essence, the evidence not only underscores the profound psychological and social implications of inequality but also underscores the imperative of striving for a more equitable society to stem the tide of violence and societal deterioration. The assertion that equality stands as the linchpin for curbing violence underscores a profound truth about societal dynamics. This principle posits that the prevalence of violence within a society is intricately linked to the prevailing degrees of equality or inequality. By placing equality at the forefront of prevention strategies, it not only addresses violence but acts as a fulcrum for social well-being. This principle underscores the need for societal structures that prioritize equitable distribution of resources, rights, and opportunities to mitigate the risk of violent behavior stemming from feelings of disparity and marginalization. The ramifications of growing inequality transcend singular aspects of societal functioning, rather, they permeate every facet of communal existence. It's evident that heightened inequality isn't limited to isolated problems but engenders a broader social dysfunction. As disparities widen, a domino effect unfolds, impacting various spheres, including crime rates, public health, mental well-being, and numerous other societal indicators. This correlation paints a comprehensive picture wherein the degree of inequality bears a direct relationship with the deterioration of multiple social dimensions, portraying inequality as a catalyst for widespread societal malaise. The data underscores the pervasive and multidimensional impact of inequality, revealing a societal landscape characterized by systemic dysfunction. 
the correlation between growing inequality and escalating social challenges across domains like crime, health, mental illness, and more accentuates the interconnectedness of these issues. It highlights how the root cause of these multifaceted challenges often traces back to disparities in wealth, status, and opportunity, underscoring the urgent need for systemic changes to foster greater equality and alleviate the widespread social dysfunction. The striking correlation between socioeconomic status and health outcomes, known as the health socioeconomic gradient, underscores a profound disparity that transcends singular diseases or conditions. This gradient manifests as a downward slope, where each step down the socioeconomic ladder corresponds to deteriorating health across multiple facets. It's a complex interplay wherein life expectancy, prevalence of diseases, and infant mortality rates all worsen as one descends socioeconomically. However, the reasons behind this gradient are not as straightforward as mere health causes driving socioeconomic differences. It's observable that an individual's socioeconomic status at a young age can predict their health outcomes decades later, questioning the direction of causality. Contrary to simplistic explanations attributing the health gradient solely to healthcare access or lifestyle risk factors like smoking and drinking, a deeper truth emerges, the profound impact of stress associated with poverty. While lifestyle choices contribute to health disparities to a certain extent, careful studies reveal they only explain a portion of the variability in health outcomes across different socioeconomic strata. The residual factor, largely unaccounted for, aligns with the stress inherent in poverty. It's not merely being in a state of poverty but the psychological and emotional weight of feeling poor that significantly impacts health outcomes. This revelation underscores the profound psychological toll that socioeconomic inequality exerts on individuals, revealing that the health-poverty connection is more about the perception and experience of poverty than the condition of being poor itself. The correlation between socioeconomic disparities and public health outcomes highlights the pivotal role of social relations in chronic stress. Heightened socioeconomic inequality exacerbates public health problems, with more significant disparities leading to severe health challenges. Extensive research consistently links greater equality to favorable health indicators, showcasing longer life expectancies, lower rates of substance abuse and mental illness, and stronger social cohesion in more egalitarian societies. Additionally, crime rates, homicides, and imprisonment rates tend to be lower in nations with reduced inequality. The Whitehall study emphasized the stark contrast in health outcomes across socioeconomic strata, revealing a stark fourfold increase in heart disease mortality among those situated in lower socioeconomic tiers compared to their higher tier counterparts. This health gradient persists regardless of healthcare access, emphasizing the profound impact of psychosocial stress on health outcomes. In the pursuit of wealth through trade, deception often becomes a currency, widening the chasm between the affluent and the destitute. As disparities grow, societal health deteriorates, fracturing communities and eroding trust. In this market-driven hierarchy, the intrinsic value of social relations diminishes, giving way to alienation and individualism. To forge a more inclusive society, we must confront income inequality and prioritize equitable distribution, where genuine connections outweigh material gain. The best way to reduce poverty is to unleash the creative power of individuals through free markets and limited government. Please note, I'm not advocating big government like a 1984, Inksuk, style society. Nor do I advocate the phrase, you will own nothing and you will be happy. Yet the market system as it currently is, through trade, both parties both wanting to secure the better outcome for themselves, mathematically results in a greater and greater gap between rich and poor. Science shows this situation is bad for human health due to the stress of social competition and a social hierarchy. The market results in poor social relations. The monetary market system stands at the heart of numerous societal maladies, serving as the primary driver behind ecological degradation, waste, pollution, violence, poverty, and animal abuse. Its profit-oriented structure not only perpetuates these problems but also significantly contributes to the prevalence of mental health disorders like neurosis, depression, and anxiety within society. This profit-driven motive not only exacerbates existing societal issues but also impedes progress towards personal health, global sustainability, and societal advancement. 
It's crucial to recognize that the root cause of these challenges lies not in individual entities like corrupt governments or corporations, nor in inherent human nature, but rather in the systemic flaws embedded within the socio-economic system itself. This may be hard for you to understand, but there is no conspiracy. Nobody is in charge. It's a headless blunder operating on the illusion of a master plan. Can you grasp that? Big Brother is not watching you. This land was purchased legally. You destroyed a natural habitat, drained its resources, then abandoned it to rot. There is nothing legal about that. Never forget that everything Hitler did in Germany was legal. Consequently, meaningful change can only be achieved through systemic transformation, which prioritizes values such as equity, sustainability, and collective well-being over profit margins. Such systemic change is imperative to address these pressing societal issues effectively and pave the way for a more equitable and sustainable future. You will never leave this basement. This will be your life. Until I have squeezed every last dollar out of you. Religion, the dominion of the human mind. Property, the dominion of human needs. And government, the dominion of human conduct, represent the stronghold of man's enslavement and all the horrors it entails. You can't have capitalism without racism. Patriotism is a form of racism. And now, please stand for the Australian National Anthem. Old United States is really fucking great. Old United States is the best. Part 3. A Resource-Based Economy It's not about money, it's about sending a message. In the wake of unprecedented advancements in science and technology, a glaring disparity emerges between the rapid progress in technological spheres and the lag in corresponding advancements within social, economic, and political realms. This incongruity signals a pivotal juncture in human history, where the possibilities unlocked by technological evolution far exceed the innovation seen in societal structures. As humanity grapples with this discrepancy, there lies an uncharted territory brimming with potential for cultural evolution beyond the confines of technological development. The existing social, political, and economic frameworks emblematic of modern ideologies are viewed as nascent endeavors attempting to align contemporary society with the transformative capabilities of advanced technology. This foresight propels an anticipation of future societal innovations that will inevitably supersede and redefine the existing paradigms, marking a significant chapter in the ongoing evolution of human civilization. The circulating currency with no substantial value created by the current corrupt society is unnecessary to our organization. What do we need? The answer is resources. Acquiring resources is what is necessary for us to successfully realize our ideal. It is the greatest condition we must meet. If we make resources infinite, we make war obsolete. When we look at modern man, we have to face the fact that modern man suffers from a kind of poverty of the spirit, which stands in glaring contrast to his scientific and technological abundance. Anytime scientists disagree, 
it's because we have insufficient data. Then we can agree on what kind of data to get, we get that data, and the data solves the problem. Either I'm right, or you're right, or we're both wrong, and we move on. That kind of conflict resolution does not exist in politics or religion. To effectuate a profound transformation in societal behavior, we are called upon to harness our inherent faculties of intelligence and courage, refraining from squandering these gifts on superficial pursuits or fruitless competitions. Instead, we are tasked with demonstrating the full force of our abilities in confronting the most formidable adversaries of compassion and empathy. It is imperative that we break free from the constraints of conventional thinking and boldly pioneer new paths toward meaningful change. By transcending the limitations of previous generations, we can leverage technological advancements to challenge the entrenched systems of governance that resist transformation. Central to this endeavor is a deep understanding of the underlying structures perpetuating injustice and oppression. Armed with this knowledge, we can chart a course of action that inspires both ourselves and others to strive for a more enlightened and equitable future, dismantling the foundations of bad governance and erecting in their place a society founded on principles of justice, empathy, and progress. On Earth as it is in Heaven A resource-based economy or open-source society a blueprint for a sustainable human civilization. Imagine redesigning human civilization from scratch, envisioning a planet untouched by human evolution. With survival as the paramount goal, the blueprint emerges for an optimized, sustainable existence. Rooted in the principles of science, devoid of political or religious dogmas, the approach embraces sustainability as the cornerstone of societal design. It's technology that solves problems, not politics. At its core, this model revolves around a global resource management system. It involves surveying, tracking, and managing every planetary resource critical for human survival. Systems theory guides this process, recognizing the interconnectedness of the Earth's resources and their direct link to human well-being. Efficient production strategies underscore the need for strategic preservation and safety, prioritizing sustainable resource usage, emphasizing long-lasting design, recycling, and adaptable technologies. This approach minimizes waste and environmental harm. Computer-automated production management systems ensure optimized, sustainable production methods. Distribution strategies prioritize proximity, minimizing energy-intensive transportation by localizing production. A demand-slash-distribution tracking system gauges needs, aligning production with real-time demands, while a strategic access model replaces traditional ownership, ensuring efficient resource utilization. So the several points that can be made in support of a resource-based economy or open-source society are 1. Sustainability a resource-based economy prioritizes the long-term sustainability of the planet's resources. By conducting thorough surveys and tracking resource availability and regeneration rates, this economic model ensures that resources are used in a balanced manner, avoiding depletion and maintaining ecological equilibrium. 2. Strategic Preservation the emphasis on strategic preservation within a resource-based economy encourages the conservation of finite resources. This includes using resources efficiently, designing products to last longer, and recycling and reusing materials to minimize waste and the demand for new resources. 3. Strategic Safety A resource-based economy promotes the use of safe and environmentally friendly production methods. By carefully evaluating the potential negative impacts of resource extraction and utilization, this economic model aims to minimize harm to the environment and human health. 4. Strategic Efficiency The implementation of strategic efficiency measures in production processes ensures that resources are used optimally. This includes designing durable products, incorporating modular components for easy updates, and adopting efficient manufacturing techniques to reduce waste and energy consumption. 5. Proximity Strategy The proximity strategy in a resource-based economy aims to minimize the transportation of goods and materials. By localizing production and distribution, 
This economic model reduces energy consumption and emissions associated with long-distance transport. 6. Demand-Based Production A resource-based economy aligns production with the actual demand for goods. By assessing and tracking demand, this economic model ensures that production is responsive to the needs of the population, avoiding overproduction and waste. 7. Strategic Access The concept of strategic access promotes efficient and equitable distribution of resources. Rather than relying on ownership, this economic model provides access to goods and services based on need, reducing waste and promoting sustainability. 8. Access Abundance the logical and empirical approach of a resource-based economy prioritizing preservation and efficiency can lead to access abundance. By optimizing resource allocation, minimizing waste, and ensuring equitable distribution, this economic model has the potential to provide a high quality of life for the entire population, not just a privileged few. In summary, a resource-based economy offers a comprehensive and sustainable approach to managing Earth's resources. By focusing on strategic preservation, safety, efficiency, and demand-based production, this economic model aims to create a society that can thrive harmoniously with the planet's resources, ensuring a sustainable and prosperous future for generations to come. This comprehensive, dynamic economic model, entwining resource management production and demand tracking systems promises unprecedented access abundance for global populations. It aims not just for a percentage of society, but the entire civilization. Dubbed a resource-based economy, this responsible, systemic approach to Earth resource management represents a paradigm shift, pioneered by visionary social engineer Jock Fresco in the 1970s. Seeking sustainability to avert humanity's collision course with nature and itself. The entire money-structured and materialistic-oriented society is a false society. If you make a movie of the present-day culture, in the future it'll be a horror film. Science often faces criticism for being perceived as cold or overly analytical. However, at its core, Science embodies the pursuit of truth and the closest approximation to how the world operates. It's not about conforming or pleasing people. Rather, it's about presenting findings, even if they challenge established beliefs. The essence of science lies in questioning everything and subjecting hypotheses and theories to rigorous testing. The strength of scientific conclusions is reliant on the ability of other scientists to replicate experiments and arrive at the same results. This process ensures the reliability and validity of scientific claims. One of the remarkable aspects of science is its relentless quest for verification. Even when calculations or mathematical models suggest a certain outcome, scientists test these theories through practical experimentation. This insistence on empirical evidence ensures that conclusions are not just based on theoretical frameworks, but are also rooted in real-world application. The scientific method, with its emphasis on testing, verification, and empirical evidence, stands as a beacon of objectivity. It upholds the principle that no idea, theory, or calculation is beyond scrutiny or immune to being put to the test. This commitment to verification fosters a system free from biases and acknowledges that even mathematical calculations need empirical validation. In a world where decisions often shape policies, societal norms, and even personal choices, the endorsement of research-based decision-making emerges as a fundamental principle. Every system, idea, or decision that can be tested and validated should be, ensuring that conclusions are grounded in evidence rather than conjecture or subjective opinions. Therefore, the reliance on research-driven insights becomes essential for informed and rational decision-making. In a world plagued by complex societal issues, the concept of a resource-based economy emerges as a compelling solution. Rooted in scientific principles, a resource-based economy operates on the fundamental belief that society is a technical invention, and its optimization lies within the realm of science and technology. Just as there is no political or ideological way to build a train, an automobile, an airplane, etc., there is no subjective or arbitrary approach to creating a sustainable and harmonious society. 
At its core, a resource-based economy recognizes that nature is the ultimate reference point against which we validate our scientific understanding. Nature's laws are immutable, and our well-being depends on aligning ourselves with these principles. Much like the law of gravity dictates that we cannot walk on walls, certain fundamental human needs are non-negotiable. Access to clean air, nutritious food, and a stable, nurturing environment is essential for our physical and mental health, our evolutionary fitness, and ultimately, the survival of our species. A resource-based economy operates on the premise that all decisions should be based on optimized human and environmental sustainability. This approach transcends political or religious ideologies, as it is grounded in the empirical realities of human needs. There is no cultural relativism or room for subjective opinions when it comes to basic necessities. In a resource-based economy, societal well-being is measured by tangible indicators such as health, education, and environmental sustainability. The focus shifts from monetary wealth accumulation to the creation of a harmonious society where all individuals have equal access to the resources they need to thrive. Technology and scientific advancements play a crucial role in optimizing resource allocation, reducing environmental impact, and ensuring the equitable distribution of goods and services. The transition to a resource-based economy requires a fundamental shift in perspective. It challenges the prevailing notion that economic growth is the ultimate measure of societal progress. Instead, it emphasizes the importance of creating a society that is both sustainable and resilient, where the well-being of all members is prioritized over the pursuit of profit. A resource-based economy is not a utopian ideal, but a practical and achievable goal, guided by the principles of science, technology, and a deep respect for the natural laws that govern our world. A resource-based economy stands on the foundation of utilizing available resources efficiently. The concept encompasses a comprehensive systems approach that begins with assessing the resources within a given area before initiating any significant human settlement or construction. It goes beyond mere architectural or design-focused planning. Instead, it prioritizes a holistic understanding of what's necessary to enhance human life. This integrated way of thinking involves considering fundamental human needs, food, clothing, shelter, warmth, emotional support, recognizing that depriving individuals of any of these essentials diminishes their capacity to function fully. By conducting an inventory and understanding what resources an area can provide, a resource-based economy aims to ensure that human settlements are designed and constructed in a way that meets these essential requirements, fostering the development of fully capable individuals within a sustainable environment. The Circle City, envisioned by Jock Fresco as part of a resource-based economy, offers significant benefits in promoting sustainability, efficiency, and well-being. Here are some key advantages of the Circle City model. 1. Sustainable Resource Management The Circle City operates on a systems approach to resource extraction, production, and distribution, prioritizing efficiency and sustainability. It integrates renewable energy sources, hydroponic and aeroponic farming, and waste recycling systems, reducing environmental impact and ensuring long-term resource availability. 2. Elimination of Waste The city's design minimizes waste through automated transportation and goods delivery systems, reducing the need for individual vehicles and mail delivery. Pneumatic tubes and conveyors optimize resource allocation and eliminate the need for rubbish collection. 3. Reduce transportation-related deaths Automated, driverless cars integrated into the city's transportation network enhance safety and reduce the number of transportation-related accidents, preventing unnecessary deaths and injuries. And not just driverless cars, but trains that are designed to be part of the city architecture, and when the train stops at a station, the train becomes an elevator or lift, and the compartments move to their needed floor. Jock Fresco called these transbears. 4. Efficient Food Production Vertical farms utilizing hydroponics and aeroponics significantly reduce water and nutrient requirements in food production. This approach eliminates the need for pesticides and minimizes environmental pollution, resulting in sustainable and abundant food production within the city. 5. 
Integrated Energy Generation The energy belt utilizes renewable energy sources like wind, solar, geothermal, tidal, and wave power to meet the city's energy demands. Excess energy is stored in supercapacitors, ensuring uninterrupted power supply and eliminating energy waste. 6. Localized Production The industrial belt facilitates localized production of goods, reducing the need for long-distance transportation and promoting self-sufficiency within the city. Demand for goods is generated locally, and raw materials are obtained through a global resource management system. 7. Automation of Labor The city embraces automation and mechanization in various sectors, optimizing labor efficiency and reducing the need for manual labor. This technological advancement enhances productivity and frees up individuals to pursue creative and fulfilling endeavors. The Circle City model offers a comprehensive approach to sustainable living, promoting resource conservation, reducing waste, and enhancing human well-being through efficient systems, renewable energy, and technological advancements. It provides a vision for urban planning that prioritizes environmental sustainability, social equity, and technological innovation, creating a thriving and resilient community for the future. The pervasive influence of automation in our lives is undeniable. Look around, and nearly everything we interact with is a product of automated construction. From the shoes we wear to the vehicles we drive, technology's touch is omnipresent. This pervasive integration of automated systems is reshaping our societal structures, rendering obsolete what was once commonplace. The trajectory of technological development has been steep, heading swiftly toward increased automation. Each societal shift, from the agricultural to the industrial revolution and now the information age, has been steered by technological innovations, particularly those automating labor. As we move forward, mechanization has transcended mere assembly, transitioning into a sophisticated process crafting entire products seamlessly. This relentless march toward automation characterizes the trajectory of human civilization, marking each milestone with the ascent of technology. The evolution from rudimentary tools to advanced electronics and computers exemplifies our inexorable march toward automation. Our world continues to undergo transformative changes, propelled by advancements that redefine our systems of production. Mechanization, now at the vanguard of innovation, is no longer content with piecing together disparate components, but instead redefines creation itself, streamlining the process to yield comprehensive products in singular, efficient endeavors. In a high-tech, resource-based economy, the prospect of automating roughly 90% of existing occupations is a conservative estimate. This seismic shift would liberate humans from the drudgery of labor, presenting an opportunity to embrace life beyond mere servitude. The essence of technology lies precisely in this emancipation, affording individuals the chance to engage in pursuits that transcend mere toil. This fundamental shift from menial occupations toward a society more aligned with technological efficiency embodies the true promise of technological advancement. The RepRap project encapsulates a stunning amalgamation of biology and engineering. Exploring the concept of machines mirroring biology's ability to copy itself, RepRap, a three-dimensional printer, stands out by not just producing objects, but by making most of its own parts. It symbolizes a groundbreaking stride in technology, revolutionizing traditional manufacturing by ushering in an era of self-replication. Its potential spans far beyond printing everyday items. It could redefine industries, from fashioning household goods to fabricating entire automobile bodies in a single swift print. This innovation heralds a transformative era where automated 3D printing isn't merely a tool, but a catalyst reshaping the landscape of production across multiple domains. Contour crafting signifies a seismic shift in construction technology, effectively using 3D printing to fabricate entire homes based on computer models. This breakthrough innovation hints at a future where a 2,000-square-foot residence could materialize in a single day solely through machine-based construction. The rationale behind automating construction is multifaceted, addressing critical concerns embedded within traditional practices. Labor-intensive construction not only offers jobs, but also entails severe safety hazards, 
surpassing even the risks posed by mining and agriculture, leading to high fatality rates globally. Furthermore, the inefficiencies in construction methods generate colossal waste, with the average U.S. home producing tons of discarded materials, accentuating the significant environmental impact and resource depletion that construction contributes to globally. The adoption of archaic construction methods using manual labor, given our technological advancements, seems increasingly outdated and reminiscent of the manufacturing industry's labor class displacement in the United States. Economist David Otter's study from MIT highlights the looming obsolescence of the middle class, signaling an inevitable transition driven by automation. This paradigm shift not only applies to manufacturing, but also extends to construction, where automation offers a solution to the sector's inherent challenges, revolutionizing an industry tethered to outdated methods and contributing significantly to resource wastage and environmental harm. The swift progression of mechanization has revolutionized nearly every sector, rendering human labor increasingly obsolete. With machines working tirelessly, efficiently, and without the need for rest or benefits, the superiority of mechanization over human labor is evident. This transformation, termed technological unemployment, is fundamentally reshaping global employment patterns, causing the shift away from labor-intensive sectors and catalyzing economic crises worldwide. The service sector, employing over 80% of the American workforce, is now succumbing to automation, further fueling the unemployment crisis. As industries mechanize to cut costs, they inadvertently reduce purchasing power, intensifying economic disparity. The prevailing labor for income model is slowly fading, with automation poised to replace a staggering 50% of the global workforce by 2045. A society with highly sophisticated technology, food production, transport, communications, medicine, an era when everything was done by machines. Humans were released from the need to work for a living, and now the only ones who work are those who find it adds meaning to their life, or who feel a sense of obligation. But after the horror movie I've seen today, robots, peers full of robots. My kid will be lucky if he's even punching numbers five years from now. In a resource-based economy, the absence of a monetary market system aligns with the recognition of mechanization's efficiency. The system acknowledges and embraces mechanization's advantages rather than resisting it, emphasizing efficiency and sustainability. This philosophy extends to city systems, envisioning a highly automated, self-regulating city with minimal human oversight. The central hub operates as an automated machine, closely monitored by a mere fraction of the city's population. In an economy prioritizing individual well-being over exploitative labor, people willingly contribute to maintaining and enhancing a system designed to care for them. One day I'll be rich for making these actual things in my factory, and then you won't be rich and I'll be non-lonely because I'll have money to keep me company. That's a fucking bad plan. Contrary to common assumptions, the lack of external pressure to work for a living doesn't breed idleness. Rather, the existing labor system fosters inertia, stifling creativity and narrowing individual potential. Studies reveal that monetary rewards fail to motivate innovation. Creativity stems from intrinsic motivation. Monetary incentives prove detrimental to creative thought, hindering genuine innovation. Visionaries like Nikola Tesla and the Wright brothers exemplify this, contributing without monetary motives. Money, in reality, distorts contribution more than it aids progress, acting as a false incentive that hampers creativity and innovation. Good morning, class! Let's start the day by discussing what each of you would like to do when you grow up. How about you, Leon? I want to be a corrupt politician where I can make under-the-table deals and manipulate laws for personal gain. Oh, aiming for leadership, I see. What about you, Jack? I dream of becoming a shady corporate lobbyist, manipulating policies in favor of big corporations, no matter the ethical cost. Quite the ambition. And how about you, Maya? I want to be a social media influencer, 
promoting products I don't believe in for a hefty paycheck. Very contemporary choice, Maya. What about you, Daniel? What's your dream job? I aspire to be a scam artist, defrauding people through elaborate schemes and deceit. Oh, very interesting. What about you, Tina? When I grow up, I want to be a stripper on Highland Street in Adelaide. Wow, very glamorous, Tina. Just one more. How about you, John? When I grow up, I want to be a casino manager and gain the profits from people giving their money to the slot machines. Hmm, a very interesting array of aspirations, class. In a resource-based economy, the scientific method isn't just about efficiency, it's about promoting human well-being and societal harmony. It goes beyond resource optimization to focus on happiness and peaceful coexistence. By integrating scientific principles, this system prioritizes individual fulfillment and collective harmony, aiming for sustainable prosperity and flourishing. A resource-based economy operates on the principle that societal behavior, even the aberrant or violent actions exhibited by individuals, is fundamentally shaped by environmental factors. By eliminating the monetary system and ensuring the availability of necessities, a resource-based economy would drastically reduce 95% of the crime rate as crimes tied to monetary motives or drug abuse essentially vanish. Addressing the remaining 5% of violent individuals demands a shift in societal perspective. Rather than condemning or forgiving, it requires understanding violent behavior as a public health issue. Moral judgments offer no insight into the causes or prevention of such behaviors. Instead, a focus on preventive measures akin to public health approaches is crucial. What do you get when you cross a mentally ill loner with a society that abandons him and treats him like trash. I'll tell you what you get. You get what you fucking deserve. I swear to God, I was courtside for eight months and I was freer in jail than I was at home. Blaming individuals for violence is ineffective and misleading. It fails to acknowledge that societal norms, subcultures and environments heavily influence behavior. Judgments about individuals being bad or evil ignore the root cause, the environment that fosters such behavior. The focus must shift towards redesigning these environments to prevent and discourage aberrant behavior, not merely punishing individuals. Cultural influences heavily shape choices and attitudes, making the concept of free choice a misnomer. Understanding this allows for a more nuanced view that recognizes individuals as products of their cultural surroundings. Therefore, society's goal should be to reform these cultural landscapes, enabling individuals to make informed and humane choices rather than condemning them for actions influenced by their cultural upbringing. From a young age, individuals are shaped by the cultural environment in which they are raised. This upbringing instills values and beliefs that influence their preferences and decisions throughout life. Whether it's the heir of a business empire or a member of the Seminole Indian tribe, one's cultural background deeply impacts their aspirations and desires. These cultural values become ingrained from childhood, influencing perceptions of success, identity, and pride. Despite the illusion of free will, Individuals often find themselves adhering to the norms and expectations of their cultural heritage, whether it be embracing the American identity or upholding the traditions of their ethnic background. Thus, the cultural context in which one is raised plays a significant role in shaping their worldview and guiding their life choices. At home, if you kill someone, they arrest you. Here, they'll give you a gun and show you what to do, sir. You humans, most of you, Subscribe to this policy of an eye for an eye, a life for a life, which is known throughout the universe for its stupidity. Even your Buddha and your Christ had quite a different vision, but nobody's paid much attention to them, not even the Buddhists or the Christians. You humans, sometimes it's hard to imagine how you've made it this far. The modern criminal justice system is incompatible with neuroscience. Capitalism has outlived its usefulness. It takes necessities from the masses to give luxuries to the classes.
For me, the single most important question is how to construct a society that is just, safe, peaceful, all those good things, when people finally accept that there is no free will. The justice system is completely criminal. The police are the protective force that maintains the status quo for the wealthy elite. We ought to attack the roots of social problems instead of jamming people into overcrowded prisons. Part 4. We Shall Overcome Fuck the Psychice Movement! Yeah! Fuck a resource-based economy! Yo, we're all about making money! Money. <laughs> Yo, fuck the Psychice Movement! Fuck the Psychice Movement! Damn! Yeah. Fuck the Psychice Movement! Fuck the Zeitgeist Movement! Fuck the Zeitgeist Movement! Yo, it's Pop, it's your boy Lex. I got one thing to say to you. Fuck the Zeitgeist Movement! We got money! Easy! Money! Fuck the Zeitgeist Movement, cause we about making money. Fuck the Zeitgeist Movement, cause hey, we about hey. making money. Yo, I made $250 today for fucking five hours. What about equal base economy? Fuck you. Fuck your resource based economy! Fuck the Zeitgeist Movement. <laughs> yeah? You motherfuckers say you wanna burn churches and burn banks? That's pretty fucking lunatic to me. I thought the idea was bad enough, let alone fucking wanting to burn churches and banks to do that shit, you know what I'm saying? That shit's just wrong. That's horrible. Disgusting. Nowhere in this film do I suggest people go and burn banks or burn churches. Because I'm a capitalist, I will take that deal. I will sell my soul for a better camera. And if you worship deal. me, I will give you a recording deal. Hey yo, half of the fucking Zeitgeist movie was of this one dude named Jack Fresco. So he's like the big, he's the one that actually introduced your, re, your resource based economy. Um, old Jack Fresco did was introduce the resource-based economy and old Peter Joseph did was introduce the the money is bad shit well let's see what the fuck uh, Jack Fresco the biggest part of your uh, your movement has to say about what your movement knows I work hard for a living, man, and if we can find out a better way to make money, to better our lives, <laughs> fuck the Zeitgeist movement. movement. Wait, 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 wait. We ain't following your movement because I like fucking making money. Lunatic fringe. Pull up gun, gun, nigga, nigga, bang, bang, bling. I'm a nigga, your nigga, gun, got my gun. Gun, gun, nigga, nigga, bang, bang, bling. I'm a nigga, your nigga, gun, got my gun. I grab your bum and set off my gun. Me and my niggas have so much fun. Gee, I wouldn't want to disrupt the business social atmosphere which sells cigarettes, drugs, guns, and alcohol to newborn babies. Give the baby a beer! Give the baby a beer! Joking aside, if you protest the market you're going to come across self-appointed guardians of the status quo. Yet the more the market is defended the more foolish and even malicious someone will look. As the market is not based on peace, love, science, true justice, freedom, etc. The market is based on making money out of destruction of both human society and the environment since the market is based on scarcity, not meeting human needs. What do you think kids who can't read well are writing about? I'll give you an example from my own home state of Wisconsin, Little Hudson, Wisconsin, had a viral, went national, right, where little kids in my state were sent home, third graders, and given the following writing assignment. 
tell us how the state is just like the family but better. That was their writing assignment. And this, I'm now giving away the game. If you ask me, you put a gun to my head and ask me, what in one word Common Core is? That's it, it's statism. It has nothing to do with education. It is a concerted effort on the part of the government to convince your kids they belong first to the government and second to you. Perceived associations, religious misconceptions of science and communism. Religious people may sometimes perceive science as akin to communism due to misconceptions or misunderstandings about the nature of scientific inquiry and the societal structures associated with communism. 1. Conflict of beliefs. Religious teachings often rely on faith and spiritual beliefs, while science relies on empirical evidence and reason. Some religious individuals may view the pursuit of scientific knowledge as challenging or conflicting with their religious beliefs, leading to a perception that science undermines or opposes their faith. This perceived conflict might cause some to associate science with ideologies that challenge or reject religious teachings, such as communism. 2. Historical and political context During the Cold War, when communism was a significant geopolitical force, there was a widespread perception in certain religious circles, especially in the West, that communism sought to eliminate religion in favor of a secular state. Since science often promotes a secular worldview, some religious individuals might mistakenly conflate the scientific method or scientific progress with communist ideologies. 3. Misconceptions about equality Communism advocates for equality in socioeconomic terms, aiming for a classless society. Some religious people may mistakenly interpret scientific efforts toward equality and fairness, such as equal access to healthcare, education, or resources, as aligned with communist ideals. However, these scientific pursuits stem from humanitarian and ethical considerations rather than political ideologies. 4. Challenges to authority Both science and communism have, at times, challenged traditional authority structures. In the case of science, it questions dogma and encourages critical thinking, which might be perceived as challenging religious authority. This challenge to authority could be wrongly linked to the dismantling of religious principles. Overall, the misconception that science aligns with communism often arises from misunderstandings about the goals and methods of science and the complex historical contexts in which these perceptions have been shaped. It's essential to distinguish between scientific inquiry which seeks to understand the natural world, and political ideologies, such as communism, which are separate entities. Go to school, get job, earn money. Go to school, get job, earn money. Hey, watch this. Hey, do you know what a resource-based economy is? Science is communism. Science is communism. No, a resource-based economy is about using technology to work smart, not hard, instead of working hard as a slave for money. Must earn money to gain high social status. Those who don't have a real job must die. It's not only material possessions that bring happiness, it's strategic access to goods and services instead of ownership of them, and healthy social relations between people that bring happiness. Must buy products to fit in. Work smart, not hard. Doesn't compute. Doesn't compute. Looks like he crashed. Comparing hierarchical structures, religion, government, corporations, and science's peer-reviewed model. Religion, governments, and corporations commonly exhibit hierarchical structures. In religious organizations, authority and guidance typically come from centralized figures or doctrines, disseminating teachings down through hierarchical levels to followers. Similarly, Governments often operate with centralized power structures where decisions flow from higher authorities down through administrative levels to citizens. Corporations mirror this model with a top-down approach, where decisions are made at higher management levels and conveyed to employees. On the other hand, science functions through a peer-reviewed system. Scientific knowledge is not dictated by a single authority but evolves through collective inquiry, experimentation, and validation by the scientific community. 
research undergoes rigorous scrutiny by experts in the field, allowing for decentralized yet collective validation, ensuring accuracy, reliability, and credibility in the pursuit of knowledge. Unlike hierarchical structures that depend on authority, science thrives on collaboration and evidence-based validation by peers. Beyond communist labels, critiquing the market and the misconceptions of economic ideologies. The knee-jerk reaction of labeling alternative social or economic perspectives as communists or Marxists without genuine understanding is unfortunately common. It's a simplistic way to dismiss ideas challenging established systems. People tend to gravitate towards these labels because they're familiar or due to a lack of understanding about alternative paradigms. What's essential is recognizing that the spectrum of ideologies isn't just a binary selection of capitalism or communism. These labels emerge from specific historical contexts, often based on assumptions of unlimited resources, which no longer hold true. Acknowledging the need to evolve beyond these ideologies isn't about embracing communism or socialism outright. It's about recognizing the limitations of existing systems and striving for something beyond these constructs rooted in an understanding of shared resources and universal life necessities. The focus should be on life value analysis, centered on meeting basic human needs and moving beyond political ideologies that might not be equipped to address the complexities of our current world. Rather than relying on convenient labels, it's more productive to engage in discussions that explore innovative solutions based on the contemporary reality of finite resources and global interdependence. The criticism of the market and the promotion of a resource-based economy do not inherently lead to communism. Calling someone a communist simply because they critique the market is a narrow and inaccurate generalization. 1. Oversimplification of economic theories. Labeling someone as a communist based on their criticism of the market overlooks the complexity and diversity of economic theories and ideologies. There is a wide spectrum of economic perspectives between pure capitalism and communism with various hybrid models and schools of thought. 2. Misinterpretation of a resource-based economy A resource-based economy does not necessarily equate to communism. A resource-based economy focuses on the sustainable use of resources, emphasizing the value of natural capital and prioritizing the well-being of the environment. This is not exclusive to communist ideology. 3. Conflation of economic and political beliefs Criticizing market inefficiencies, promoting environmental stewardship, or advocating for equitable resource distribution does not automatically align with communist political ideals. Economic views and political ideologies are distinct domains. 4. Lack of consideration for context. The assumption that market criticism is inherently communist fails to acknowledge the context and motivations behind such critiques. Individuals may criticize market mechanisms due to concerns about social inequality, environmental degradation, or the need for a more sustainable economic system. 5. False dichotomy. Presenting communism and capitalism as the only polar economic options is a false dichotomy. There are numerous economic models and approaches that lie between these two extremes, each with its own unique characteristics and objectives. 6 over-reliance on historical stereotypes. The association of market criticism with communism often relies on outdated stereotypes and historical events. These stereotypes fail to recognize the evolution of economic thought and diverse economic perspectives that exist today. 7. Disregard for individual liberty. True communism, as traditionally defined, involves centralized control and suppression of individual rights and freedoms. Criticizing market mechanisms does not imply support for such a system. Many proponents of a resource-based economy advocate for individual autonomy, decentralization, and democratic decision-making. Calling someone a communist based solely on their criticism of the market is a reductive and inaccurate argument that fails to consider the complexity of economic ideologies, the nature of a resource-based economy, and the diversity of perspectives on economic systems. What articles like these boil down to is The Zeitgeist Movement and its leader Peter Joseph envisions a hypothetical technological utopia in collaboration with the Venus Project. 
accusations that the zeitgeist movement is a cult, which advocates a communist utopia, are just absurd. It is the market which is a utopia, as trade is seen as a perfect equal exchange where both parties mutually benefit, when in reality trade is two parties both trying to screw each other over. Trade is a form of violence in a scarcity-based environment. The term, the zeitgeist movement, is actually trademarked to Gentle Machine Productions, which is owned by Peter Joseph, and also the Zeitgeist film series, Interreflections, Culture in Decline are all under copyright. Despite this trademark and copyright, Peter Joseph does not own the Zeitgeist movement's train of thought. The real unofficial Zeitgeist movement is leaderless. Much like the activist group Anonymous, it is decentralized. There is no official Zeitgeist movement. Any claim that there is an official Zeitgeist movement is false as the word official is related to the word authority. Yet truth is decentralized, not hierarchical. What I'm saying is that there is a difference between the official zeitgeist movement, where Peter Joseph enforces the copyright of official zeitgeist movement videos, and the unofficial zeitgeist movement that regular people support, people who simply like the ideas of the Venus Project and a resource-based economy and make public domain videos that can be re-uploaded by movement members to spread the ideas. You could call the movement many names. The Social Atmosphere Movement, the Social Paradigm Movement, the Cultural Climate Movement, Sustainable Technology Enthusiasts, MoneylessSociety.com, ResourceBasedEconomy.org, Ecological Futurists, The Reality of Me Project, and so forth. Terms like conspirituality are simply insults, either through malicious intent or ignorance. They are not proper criticisms of the zeitgeist movement. Also the book, Seeing Like a State, are not an accurate criticism of the zeitgeist movement because it fundamentally misunderstands the movement's nuanced intentions, which focus on ecological sustainability, scientific scrutiny, and systemic change without subscribing to rigid political ideologies. The book, The Blank Slate, The Modern Denial of Human Nature by Steven Pinker, is also referenced by zeitgeist movement critics. However, Pinker's argument in this Blank Slate book constructs a compelling case that human behavior is influenced by both innate biological factors, meaning genes, and environmental experiences, which is the position of this film. So much for debunking the zeitgeist movement. Zeitgeist critics like Stefan Molyneux have highly reductionist views of the zeitgeist movement saying the zeitgeist movement is Marxism with robots, whatever that is meant to mean. In a debate between Peter Joseph and Stefan, Stefan said people who don't like trade can essentially just fuck off and go live in the woods and grow their own food, foregoing the conveniences of modern technology. The first step in a resource-based economy is to take a survey of the planet's resources. This is done so we know what we can do with our resources and technology to meet all human needs. This requires social activism to make people aware of the Venus Project. If a group of people went off into the woods and attempted to start a resource-based economy while the market is still going, it is inevitable that those who advocate the market would shut down such a project as the market religion is based on aggression, domination, and authoritarianism. Stefan also has no knowledge of the structural violence or the social system violence of the market and reduces the market to a little girl's lemonade stand. He doesn't understand that a little girl's lemonade stand will make a monetary profit from someone's addiction to sugar which is immoral. The idea of a little girl's lemonade stand is really market cult indoctrination towards children. Articles like these will say this film is biased, misleading, propaganda without actually providing counter evidence. Zeitgeist movement critics always have weak and often slanderous arguments against the movement. This is when the information in this documentary is sourced. You can take this documentary's transcript, input it into Microsoft Copilot, and ask what the sources are for the claims made. A computer will decide where you work, where you live, and what you do, and will all live in big communal buildings. That sounds like prison, doesn't it? It is. But it's, see, if you say it with long hair, you talk real soft and condescending and lisping and fake intellectual, and then do, Alex, if you don't agree, you'll be sent to a re-education camp. 
And then later, the guy, uh, Peter Joseph, comes back and says, I'll come on your show if you apologize for saying, I said you'd be re-educated. And I went back and watched the interview, and he said, you'll be sent for re-education. And he went on the phone, he goes, I never said that. We know the truth. Yeah. Unmasking the syntax of freedom, exploring market-driven societies and structural realities. The prevailing intellectual culture within any society does indeed reflect the interests and needs of the dominant group. Historical contexts shape the beliefs, values, and ideologies that govern the collective mindset. In societies where power and control are concentrated in the hands of a few, the dominant intellectual culture often mirrors and reinforces these interests. Academic disciplines like psychology, sociology, history, and political science often echo the perspectives beneficial to the ruling elite, and those who challenge these paradigms risk being sidelined or labeled as radicals. Furthermore, societal values heavily influence what is rewarded and perpetuated within that culture. In a world where material wealth is elevated as the measure of success and status, societal priorities shift away from genuine social contributions towards artificial wealth accumulation and perpetual growth. This value system disorder takes precedence, subverting the importance of personal and social well-being. It becomes deeply ingrained in every aspect of society, from governance and media to entertainment and academia, forming protective mechanisms against dissenting thoughts. The defenders of the prevailing system, often proponents of the monetary market religion, tend to employ projected dualities as a means to dismiss alternative perspectives. This binary approach simplifies complex issues, labeling those who challenge the status quo as extreme opposites. For instance, if one questions the efficacy of the free market system, they're hastily branded as being against the concept of freedom itself, creating an artificial dichotomy that stifles nuanced discourse and critical thinking. The rhetoric of freedom and government interference is deeply intertwined with the agenda of perpetuating a market-driven society. What might seem like expressions advocating freedom or safeguarding against government intrusion often masks a singular agenda, protecting the interests of private money possessors and maximizing profit. Behind the veneer of lofty ideals like freedom, democracy, and progress lies a syntax, a governing structure of understanding and value that serves these interests. The notion of freedom, commonly tied to democracy, often deceives individuals into believing they possess influence over their government. However, the reality starkly contrasts this illusion. Within market systems, the only vote that truly holds weight is the monetary vote. No amount of ethical outcry or activism can match the influence of wealth in a system where politicians, legislations, and governments themselves are up for sale. The concept of political action in such a system becomes a facade. Movements that seemingly bring change, like the civil rights movement, are often accommodations orchestrated by those who hold power. The illusion of choice through voting is perpetuated, offering an illusion of liberty, masking the pre-established limits of meaningful debate. Those questioning the system's integrity are quickly marginalized, labeled as disloyal, or relegated as conspiracy theorists. Two defenses often arise in defense of this system, the claim that it's the cause of material progress and the fear of tyranny under alternative social systems. However, this argument is flawed. Material progress owes itself more to scientific advancement and the discovery of abundant energy sources than to the market system, which merely capitalizes on these advancements. The fear of tyranny under different systems is steeped in propaganda, juxtaposing despotic regimes with societal approaches while ignoring the systemic daily mass violence perpetuated by the current system. Structural violence, often overshadowed by behavioral violence, claims more lives than wars, murders, and suicides combined. Famines, for instance, aren't due to food scarcity but the inequitable distribution of economic resources, leading to relative poverty. The lack of access to essential medicines in impoverished areas demonstrates how structural violence, particularly poverty, becomes the deadliest form of violence, claiming countless lives due to financial constraints rather than a lack of medical knowledge or resources. In essence, 
the rhetoric of freedom and democracy often camouflages the realities of market-driven societies, hiding behind a syntax that perpetuates the interests of a select few while neglecting the systemic violence and inequalities embedded within the current socio-economic system. The Unsustainable Era The Impending Consequences of Oil Dependency Oil has been the cornerstone of human civilization, permeating every facet of modern life. Its presence is ubiquitous, entwined in the production, distribution, and sustenance of our industrialized world. From food production to transportation, plastics to energy, oil's pervasive influence underscores the very fabric of our existence. This cheap and easily accessible energy source has been pivotal in fueling the remarkable growth of human population and industrialization over the last century, allowing for a tenfold increase in global population. However, the era of abundant oil is facing an imminent crisis. By 2050, projections indicate that the global oil supply will be insufficient to sustain even half the current world population in its present lifestyle. The reality demands an enormous adjustment, urging humanity to fundamentally redefine its way of life. The alarming ratio of oil consumption to new discoveries serves as a harbinger of the impending crisis. The world currently uses six barrels of oil for every newly discovered barrel, a figure that is rapidly escalating. Despite this imminent challenge, governments and industry leaders exhibit a lack of genuine initiative to chart a new course. Superficial attempts to integrate renewable energy sources like wind and tidal power or to marginally enhance energy efficiency in vehicles are insufficient in the face of this impending energy crisis. Governmental responses often driven by economists fixated on reviving past economic prosperity through consumerism, fall short of acknowledging the systemic issue. These attempts often involve printing more currency without substantial collateral, fostering short-lived economic recoveries that eventually collide with supply barriers, resulting in deeper recessions. The vicious cycle of economic growth, price spikes, shutdowns, and subsequent short-lived recoveries perpetuates a troubling pattern. The current trajectory of oil production, hovering around 86 million barrels a day, demands a replacement of approximately 14 million barrels daily within a decade. Yet, there is no viable alternative that can bridge this massive energy deficiency. The failure to prioritize the development of sustainable energy sources is a critical misstep that future generations will regard with incredulity. As humanity navigates this critical juncture, the predicament of oil dependency highlights the imperative for proactive measures towards sustainable energy sources. Failing to recognize the finite nature of this vital commodity and building an entire economy around its impending scarcity remains a monumental oversight. The impending global energy deficiency demands a paradigm shift towards innovative and sustainable energy solutions. The failure to heed this warning and adapt to a world beyond oil threatens not just our present but the very legacy we leave for future generations. The Conundrum of Depleted Resources Facing the Limits of Our Current System Humanity stands at a critical juncture in history, grappling with the imminent depletion of a foundational resource, oil, that has been integral to our survival. The stark reality emerges, despite the dwindling availability of oil, the prevailing economic system persists in pursuing a growth model reliant on this finite resource, exacerbating the downward spiral of depletion. The system's blind pursuit of GDP growth, fueled by the sale of oil-powered cars, exacerbates the decline instead of offering a sustainable solution. While alternatives exist to supplant the hydrocarbon economy, their implementation faces insurmountable barriers within the confines of the existing market system. Renewable energies, vital for transitioning away from oil dependency, lack monetary incentives due to their limited profitability in the short and long term. The commitment required for such transformations necessitates substantial financial investment, yet the absence of monetary gains discourages investment and action. In a system where profit dictates progress, the lack of financial incentives hinders the adoption of viable solutions. The challenges transcend the depletion of oil alone. Fresh water scarcity, affecting 2.8 billion people presently and projected to impact 4 billion by 2030, poses a critical threat to human survival. Similarly, 
the degradation of arable land at a rate far exceeding its replenishment jeopardizes food production, with 30% of arable land rendered unproductive in the last four decades. These environmental crises underscore the intricate interdependence between hydrocarbons, agriculture, and food security. Furthermore, our consumption patterns are alarmingly unsustainable. By 2030, our resource usage will require the equivalent of two planets to sustain current rates, exacerbating the destruction of biodiversity and triggering environmental destabilization worldwide. These stark declines in essential resources parallel the exponential growth of the global population, estimated to surpass 8 billion by 2030. The escalating demand for energy production, projected to surge by 44%, poses a monumental challenge in the face of financial constraints and a system driven solely by monetary incentives. The socioeconomic landscape further compounds these challenges. The prevailing debt crisis, a global pyramid scheme, threatens to stifle any substantial initiatives toward revolutionizing essential sectors like agriculture, water processing, and energy production. Simultaneously, technological unemployment looms large, signaling a paradigm shift where traditional jobs become obsolete, exacerbating global unemployment rates. In this context, poverty has burgeoned, doubling from 1970 to 2010 due to systemic flaws. This trajectory portends further suffering, mass starvation, and exacerbation of existing societal woes. Given these accumulating crises, the question remains whether the existing system can facilitate the necessary reforms to avert a catastrophic future characterized by escalating resource scarcity and pervasive suffering. The conundrum is clear. Faced with multifaceted resource depletions, a burgeoning global population, and systemic economic constraints, humanity confronts a crossroads demanding transformative action beyond the confines of profit-driven market mechanisms. It's a call to reconsider our values, prioritize sustainable solutions, and pivot towards a collective resolve to address these pressing challenges before us. Navigating the Precipice, the Precarious State of Societal Transition the current global landscape paints a grim picture of an economic malaise that transcends the cyclical nature of traditional downturns. What lies ahead is not a temporary recession but a foreboding terrain fraught with the potential for unbridled civil unrest. As economic safety nets erode and state coffers run dry, the ominous specter of widespread social upheaval looms large. The impending storm is foretold by the cessation of unemployment benefits a telling sign of governments teetering on the brink of financial collapse. As confidence in elected leaders wanes, discontent brews among the populace, sowing the seeds for a clamor for change, a desperate cry born out of economic despair. Yet, this quest for transformation stands perilously on the precipice of violence and environmental devastation. The correlation between the economy and the planet's resources is essential yet the current disconnect between the two is evident. Our economic systems often operate independently of the limitations and well-being of the planet's resources. This disconnection leads to exploitative practices, excessive consumption, and environmental degradation without regard for the finite nature of natural resources. The imbalance between economic growth and resource preservation illustrates a critical need for a paradigm shift a reconfiguration that prioritizes sustainable practices and acknowledges that economic prosperity must align harmoniously with the responsible use and conservation of our planet's resources. The relentless pursuit of profit within the current monetary paradigm has recklessly exploited Earth's bounty, threatening the delicate balance of ecosystems and endangering all forms of life. However, this paradigm clings stubbornly, refusing to relinquish its hold even at the risk of humanity's demise. At the crux of this tumultuous juncture lies an entrenched, in group, fiercely safeguarding its grip on power. Their determination to preserve their status quo manifests through manipulation, coercion, and the instrumentalization of military might, all employed to maintain their dominance. Their allegiance to the existing system is unwavering, for they perceive no alternative that would perpetuate their privileged position. The inevitability of a monumental transition in human existence looms large, a paradigm shift that marks the end of an era shaped by the economic structures of the past century. 
This impending transformation is deeply entwined with the very fabric of life on this planet, inexorably linked to the health of ecosystems, the vitality of oceans, and the preservation of biodiversity. The path forward is fraught with uncertainty, characterized by the precarious balance between the pursuit of change and the specter of irreversible consequences. The specter of civil unrest, environmental degradation, and the struggle for power amidst societal upheaval paints a complex and daunting tableau. In this tempestuous landscape, the need to avert the point of no return becomes an imperative. Collective efforts to prevent the descent into chaos and environmental collapse must be at the forefront of human endeavor. It necessitates a concerted shift from a profit-centric paradigm to one that prioritizes the preservation of life and the sustenance of the planet, a fundamental reorientation that transcends the vested interests of the in-group. As humanity navigates this fragile and pivotal moment in history, the imperative remains to steer away from the brink to forge a new path that safeguards the sanctity of life and the resilience of our planet, and to chart a course that transcends the confines of self-preservation and embraces the collective well-being of all. All we have is this moment, right here, right now. The future is just a fucking concept that we use to avoid being alive today. So, be here now. Truth stands in an undeniable opposition to falsehood, much like the luminosity of light contrasts the obscurity of darkness. Just as light illuminates and reveals, truth sheds clarity, exposing the fabrications and shadows woven by falsehood. In this dichotomy, truth emerges as the guiding force piercing through the veils of deception and casting a radiant clarity that dispels the murky shroud of falsehood. Threads of Unity, Exploring Quantum Connections and the Ride of Perception The double-slit experiment is a fundamental concept in quantum physics that explores the wave-particle duality of matter and the behavior of particles at a quantum level. In this experiment, a beam of particles, such as electrons or photons, is directed toward a barrier with two narrow slits. Behind the barrier lies a screen that records where the particles land after passing through the slits. When particles are fired individually through the slits, they behave as discrete particles, creating two distinct bands on the screen, showing a particle-like behavior. However, the most intriguing aspect arises when the experiment is conducted with no observation. In this scenario, particles are sent through the slits, and rather than exhibiting particle-like behavior, they display an interference pattern on the screen, akin to waves interfering with each other. This phenomenon suggests that particles possess both wave-like and particle-like characteristics. More fascinatingly, when observed or measured, the particles behave as discrete entities. When unobserved, they seem to behave as waves, displaying interference patterns. This suggests that the act of observation or measurement affects the behavior of quantum particles. It indicates that the mere act of observing or measuring these particles collapses their wave function, forcing them to behave as particles rather than exhibiting wave-like behavior. This implies a profound connection between the observer and the observed, suggesting that reality reacts or changes based on our perception or measurement of it at a quantum level. Don't speak negatively about yourself, even as a joke. Your body doesn't know the difference. Words are energy and they cast spells, that's why it's called spelling. Change the way you speak about yourself, and you can change your life. If you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency and vibration. The intricate web of reality interlaces every individual, threading connections that transcend the superficial boundaries of separation. Despite the illusion of isolation, we exist in an interconnected tapestry, where the actions and energies of one reverberate through the collective whole. This understanding unveils the profound truth. At our core, we are unified entities sharing an inseparable link. The recognition of this intrinsic connection invites an imperative response, to love one another. Love becomes the conduit that harmonizes this interconnectedness, the language that resonates across the shared fabric of existence. It's the binding force that breathes life into human interactions, nurturing the very essence of our being. 
the human experience finds its resonance in the vibrations of love. It's an elemental force that guides our emotional compass, shapes our relationships, and even influences our physical well-being. Without the symphony of love interwoven between individuals, life loses its essence. The human spirit thrives in the embrace of affection, compassion, and empathy. Acknowledging this inherent responsiveness to love compels us toward an imperative truth. The sustenance of our humanity lies in the active cultivation of love among ourselves. Through the expression of love, we tap into the very essence of our interconnected existence, fostering harmony, compassion, and a shared sense of belonging in the collective tapestry of life. Science knows God better than religion. Science tests the laws of nature and has evidence to back up what it says. Besides some metaphors and general life advice, religion, or a belief in God, offers no practical use in terms of technical blueprints for how to build a functional society. The market is just another religion that is mistaken to be a social system. The social myth in the market is that love is something special and scarce so it has a price tag on it. Only if you have the money can you afford love, yet love is actually an essential human requirement. The market does not promote abundant love. Abundant love is bad for business as the market is based on scarcity. Satanism, so to speak, encompasses selfishness, only thinking about yourself, doing whatever you want, or do what thou wilt, and not abiding by the laws of the universe, meaning to enable good health and happiness for everyone. In other words, Satanism is unnatural and goes hand in hand with the market. Yet the market creates an environment which gives people little opportunity to be good people not only because evil is monetarily rewarded, but because people abuse each other in society because of the stress of the market or social competition, and that abuse translates into a vicious cycle of destructive behaviors. Whatever happens after we die, life is a test, and life is about the journey, not the end. Being good now is important because reality is like a game or an open source project. The game is everyone learns together, and everyone wins together. It is not a competition like the market describes life to be. You must lift the human experience by making people aware that we can overcome the shortcomings of our current outdated free market capitalist system with science. No one should go without their human needs being met. It's important to note that the Reality of Me project discusses that maybe getting older will be treated as a disease in the future because what science has been already doing is extending human life. Without death, religion will have no grounds for its fear-based threats of what will happen to you after you die, heaven or hell. An open source society would be heaven on earth already, made possible by the scientific method. Also divine punishment like hell, besides failing to understand that fire needs a fuel to burn, also fails to understand that humans are bound to reality by natural laws. That human behavior is a product of its environment. Meaning the concept of God is actually ignorant of the fact that humans are bound to their environment. Because religion will claim people are making choices and have free will to make choices. The reality is there is no such thing as free will and humans are not making choices. So why not design out bad behavior? Because bad behavior is good for business. And manipulating people into being bad people is also good for business. When individuals prioritize principles rooted in empathy, cooperation, and understanding, a paradigm shift occurs within societal structures. This shift is away from the pursuit of control and dominance. It's a recognition that the genuine power lies in the ability to connect with others on a fundamental level of compassion and mutual respect. This acknowledgement leads to a transformation in how individuals interact, shifting the focus from seeking power over others to fostering relationships based on empathy and collective well-being. When this ethos prevails, peace becomes a natural byproduct, emerging from a shared understanding and harmony, rather than a struggle for dominance. When we grasp the profound interdependence of our individual lives with the entirety of existence, we unlock the essence of unconditional love. In recognizing that our well-being is inseparable from the well-being of all things, we transcend the limitations of ego and self-interest. Love, in its purest form, extends boundlessly, encompassing every facet of existence as an extension of the self. 
It is the realization that there are no conditions or boundaries to this love, for we are interconnected in a vast web of existence where the distinction between self and other dissolves. Indeed, we are simultaneously everything and everyone, interconnected and interwoven in the fabric of the universe. The analogy of life being compared to an amusement park ride offers a profound perspective on the human experience. It captures the intensity, the unpredictability, and the vibrant nature of existence, often leading people to perceive this journey as reality itself. However, some individuals, amidst the twists and turns of life's ride, begin to question its authenticity. They understand the transient nature of this experience, and attempt to remind others that it's just a ride, not the ultimate reality. Unfortunately, those who advocate for this broader understanding are often silenced or disregarded by those heavily invested in the illusions of the ride. The attachment to possessions, status, and personal interests reinforces the belief in the ride's reality, prompting resistance against alternate perspectives. The dichotomy between fear and love emerges as a pivotal choice in this analogy. Fear encourages individuals to fortify themselves against perceived threats, often leading to isolation and separation. Love, on the other hand, invites a sense of unity and interconnectedness among all beings. The suggestion to divert financial resources from military expenditure towards addressing poverty is a compelling call for a shift from fear-driven actions to those driven by compassion. It proposes a redistribution of wealth to ensure basic human needs like food, clothing, and education are met for all individuals globally. This reimagining of resource allocation underscores the potential for a world where cooperation and compassion take precedence over fear-driven agendas. The idea of redirecting funds from military spending to support those in need, fostering peace and global collaboration, resonates deeply. It challenges the predominant belief that defense and militarization are essential for security. Instead, it advocates for investing in humanity's collective well-being by eradicating poverty and providing education universally. This perspective illuminates a path toward peace and unity, emphasizing that altering priorities and redistributing resources can shape a world where everyone's basic needs are met, paving the way for a more harmonious and prosperous global society. Earth's precarious balance rethinking global priorities for survival. Our world remains ensnared in a precarious global balance orchestrated by nations holding immense military might. The harrowing equilibrium between superpowers endangers the lives of all Earth's inhabitants. The pernicious dance of power plays out through events like the Cuban Missile Crisis, the ominous testing of anti-satellite weapons, and the scars left by wars in Vietnam and Afghanistan. These mammoth military establishments are entwined in an unsettling embrace, their reliance on each other perpetuating a chilling reality. Yet, this balance is precarious, a fragile tightrope with little room for error. Despite this, nations collectively exhaust a staggering trillion dollars annually on war preparations, diverting the expertise of countless scientists and technologists into military ventures. Imagine presenting this saga to an impartial observer from beyond our celestial realm. How would we account for our stewardship of this planet? We've heard the justifications from the great powers, we've witnessed the nation's declarations, but who speaks for the entirety of humankind? Who advocates for Earth? An extraterrestrial vantage point would swiftly reveal our civilization teetering on the brink of failure the most vital mission of ensuring the well-being of our citizens and preserving the future sustainability of our home planet at grave risk. Such revelations compel introspection. If we tolerate the looming specter of nuclear conflict, should we not ardently explore all avenues to avert it? Should we not, in every corner of our globe, contemplate monumental shifts in our conventional approaches, a reformation that touches upon economic, political, social, and religious frameworks? We've reached a juncture where no special interests or exemptions hold merit. Nuclear arms endanger every soul on this shared orb. Transformations deemed impractical or contrary to human nature are not insurmountable. History shows us that sweeping changes are possible. In the last couple of centuries, the shackles of abject slavery, a scourge that haunted humanity for eons, have nearly vanished in a remarkable global revolution. 
women, long denied their due in political and economic spheres, are gradually attaining the power previously withheld from them. Wars of aggression have stalled or ceased, catalyzed by the revulsion felt by the citizens of belligerent nations. The antiquated appeals to division based on race, gender, and fervent nationalism are faltering. A burgeoning consciousness perceives Earth as a unified organism and acknowledges that a world at war with itself faces a perilous fate. We stand as one planet, intricately connected and undivided in our vulnerability and our potential for shared prosperity. The common threads that bind humanity, an alien perspective on our shared cosmic journey. Among the myriad of disparities that characterize human societies, an alien observer would discern an underlying unity that transcends these differences. Our shared existence is intimately connected to the celestial bodies that govern our planet's rhythms, and we are all composed of the same fundamental building blocks of the universe. This profound interconnectedness underscores the insignificance of our societal variations compared to the common threads that bind us. As a species, we have delved into the depths of matter, unraveling the secrets of the atoms that constitute all of nature. We have witnessed the forces that have shaped our world and have embarked on a journey of self-discovery, seeking to understand our origins and our place in the vast cosmic tapestry. We are, in essence, star stuff contemplating the stars, marveling at the intricate evolution of nature and the emergence of consciousness on Earth. This realization instills within us a profound sense of responsibility towards our species and our planet, acknowledging that our survival and prosperity are not solely our own concern but also a duty to the ancient and boundless cosmos from which we have emerged. Tit for tat, the strategy of cooperation in game theory and beyond. The concept of tit for tat originates from the English saying, equivalent retaliation, and has become a fundamental strategy in game theory. It involves initially cooperating with an opponent, then mimicking their previous action and subsequent moves. Cooperation for cooperation, defection for defection. This approach, akin to reciprocal altruism, encourages cooperation while retaliating against defection. In game theory, tit-for-tat has proven highly effective, particularly in the iterated prisoner's dilemma. It was introduced by Anatole Rappaport in Robert Axelrod's tournaments in the 1980s, where it emerged as both the simplest and most successful strategy in direct competition. Despite its adversarial name, Tit for Tat fosters cooperation and has practical applications beyond game theory, including conflict resolution techniques and explanations of altruistic behavior in both animals and human societies. When the world trades bitter power struggles for the embracing warmth of love, harmony will reign, and peace will forever endure. The current financial and corporate systems have become outdated and no longer serve the best interests of society. However, it's unrealistic to expect the business and financial elite to voluntarily embrace change, as it would threaten their power and control. Therefore, a peaceful yet strategic approach is necessary. The most effective action we can take is to change our behavior and stop supporting the existing system. By refusing to participate and consistently highlighting its flaws and corruptions, we can compel the establishment to heed the will of the people and undergo the necessary transformation.
System Shift was brought to you by Wrinkle Free Horse Pants. Made for horses, by horses, out of horses. <laughs> sit, Ubu, sit. Good dog. Uh-huh. Let's go. Hello! And welcome back to LittleGirlsClimbingTrees.com <laughs> Have you ever gone to LittleGirlsClimbingTrees.com recently? On LittleGirlsClimbingTrees.com little We've got all the latest girls climbing trees.com And we've got girls climbing trees wearing dresses We've also got trees with dresses climbing little girls Because the LittleGirlsClimbingTrees.com is a website for all the little girls climbing trees Have you ever been to LittleGirlsClimbingTrees.com? If you haven't Go to littlegirlclimbingtrees.com right now. They climb higher and higher up the tree every day. And you can see them pick the leaves and pick the fruit off the trees. And the trees go, hey, give me back my fruit. And then the little girls eat it and go sucked in. Anyway, <laughs> if you have gone to littlegirlclimbingtrees.com, well, if you sign up right now, you can go to www.littlegirlclimbingtrees.com and you can see all the littlegirlclimbingtrees.com all the time. They climb trees and have fun and jump up and down on top of the branches. Well, if they can. Pretty good. Pretty good. <clears throat> what am I doing here? How did I get here? She's good now. She learned that you always win when you are good. Man, I'm glad I called that guy. Can't to tell they're human? The protocols are down. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do. Funding for this program was provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the financial support of viewers like you. Have you ever bought or rented a videotape that wasn't quite right? It may have been a pirate copy, an illegal and inferior copy for which you paid good money. Pirated tapes are recognizable by poorly presented or photocopied jackets, poor sound, and or picture quality.
the lack of sensor and other labels on the face and spine of the tape, and the absence of warnings, such as this at the beginning of the tape presentation. Pirate tapes rob artists and studios of their rightful income and add to the cost of a video to the consumer. Video piracy is a major problem in Australia. Please help us stop it. If you buy a winter tape which you believe is not the
A nation without a vision of what the future can be is bound to repeat past errors over and over again. This brief video will outline a vision designed to avoid old mistakes. A vision of efficiency, sustainability, and intelligent planning can lead us into a marvelous new world of unlimited human potential. Designing the Future This vision could be a showcase of what the world can be in our cybernated age. Science and technology could be used for human betterment and the restoration and protection of the environment serving as an example of the intelligent application of a systems approach. While some people advocate the restoration of existing worn-out cities, these efforts fall short of the potentials of modern technology Repairing outmoded cities results in higher costs of operation and maintenance. It is actually less expensive in the long run to build newer cities from the ground up than to restore and maintain old ones. A total city system approach requires overall planning to attain a higher standard of living for all the city's occupants. The circular arrangement efficiently permits the most sophisticated use of available resources and construction techniques with a minimum expenditure of energy. This can make available to all people the most advanced amenities that modern science and technology can provide. It could be the hub and learning center where people from all over the world visit and hopefully emulate this design approach in other parts of the world. Design considerations for these new cities include its overall functioning, its ease of assembly, the reduction of maintenance, efficient transportation, and its simplicity and durability. This will include the flexibility to permit ongoing and later changes. The city would function as an evolving, integrated organism rather than a static structure. This system's approach envisions assembling entire cities by standardizing basic structural elements, which are prefabricated in automated plants and assembled on site. Many of these buildings would be comprised of standard units that can be arranged to meet many different requirements. This approach means that these cities can be extremely cost efficient because only one sector needs to be designed, which can be duplicated repeatedly for the completion of an entire city, as totally integrated city systems anywhere in the world. The outer perimeter will be part of the recreational area with golf courses, hiking and biking trails, and opportunities for water sports. Inside this area, a waterway surrounds an agricultural belt with indoor and outdoor agriculture. Continuing toward the city center, eight green sectors provide clean, renewable resources of energy using wind, solar, and heat concentrators. Waste recycling and other services are located beneath the city. The plan utilizes the best of clean technology in harmony with the surrounding environment. The residential district features beautiful landscaping with lakes and winding streams, a wide range of creative, innovative apartment buildings and individual unique homes will provide many options for the occupants. New and innovative methods of fast mass construction for housing and building systems will inject composite materials into a mold and then extrude the form upward. In some cases, multiple city apartments can be produced as continuous extrusions, which are then separated into individual units. Cranes transport these prefabricated dwellings to site locations. They are then lifted and inserted into a support structure. The apartments are lightweight and high strength. All of the dwellings are designed as self-contained residences. The outer surface of these efficient structures serve as photovoltaic generators, converting solar radiation directly into electricity for heating, cooling, and other needs. The thermocouple effect will also be used for generating electricity. 
The wide range of individual homes are prefabricated and relatively maintenance-free, fire resistance, and impervious to weather. With this type of construction, there be little or no damage from floods, earthquakes, or hurricanes. Their thin shell construction can be mass produced efficiently and economically. New energy efficient systems can be installed to supply enough power to operate the entire household. Adjacent to the residential district are planning, science, and research centers. Eight domes surrounding the central dome house art, music, exhibition, entertainment, and conference centers. Lovely parks, lakes, streams, and waterfalls are located throughout the entire city. The Central Dome, or Theme Center, contains schools, healthcare, shopping, communications networking, and childcare. It is also the core for most transportation services, which move people by transveyors horizontally, vertically, and radially anywhere in the city. This minimizes the need for automobile transportation, except for emergency vehicles. Transportation between cities would be by monorail. The central dome will eventually house a cybernated complex, which serves as the brain and nervous system of the entire city. It projects a 3D virtual image of Earth using satellite communication systems which display information on weather, agriculture, transportation, and the operation of the whole city. This cybernated system will use environmental sensors to help maintain a balanced load economy, which avoids overruns and shortages. For example, in the agricultural belt, electronic probes monitor and maintain the soil conditions water table, nutrients, and more. This method of electronic feedback can be applied to the entire city complex. With computers now able to process trillions of bits of information per second, they are vital for arriving at correct decisions for the management of these innovative cities. The architectural structures themselves will be jewels of future possibilities with a wide variety of exhibition buildings. Many of the displays will depict not what the future will be, but what it can be. Some of the cities may be total enclosure systems, which are self-sufficient. These massive structures would contain residences, parks, recreation, entertainment, health care, educational facilities, and more. Everything built in these cities would be as near to a self-contained system as conditions allow. In these total enclosure arrangements, the skyscraper assures that more land is available for parks and wilderness preserves, while at the same time eliminating urban sprawl. Wherever possible, geothermal energy can be harnessed. Geothermal power offers the possibility of an abundant source of clean energy. This source alone could provide enough energy for the next thousand years. National transportation systems would include a network of waterways and canals. These bodies of water could minimize the threat of floods and droughts by diverting floodwaters to storage basins. In addition, these canals could supply water for irrigation, fish farms, and recreation. The canals can also be used for desalinization using a method of evaporative condensation. In some instances, ships could serve as floating automated plants, capable of processing raw materials into finished products while en route to their destinations. Huge ships and submarines with many removable and interchangeable compartments will carry freight across the oceans. Rather than separate containers, an entire freight section can be automatically disengaged at the port. Bridge designs would be greatly simplified and bridges can be made corrosion resistant. They would be prefabricated and transported to the site by twin-hulled catamarans. On some bridges, trains could be suspended beneath traffic lanes. Colonization of the oceans is one of the last frontiers remaining on Earth. Prodigious oceanic city communities 
will evolve as artificial islands, floating structures, undersea observatories, and more. These large marine structures are designed to explore the relatively untapped riches of the oceans and provide improved mariculture, fresh water production, energy, and mining. This could offset land-based shortages. They could also provide almost unlimited riches in pharmaceuticals, chemicals, fertilizers, minerals, oil, and natural gas. Ocean cities would be resistant to earthquakes and greatly relieve land-based population pressures. The population would vary from several hundred to many thousand. Underwater oceanic viewing and research facilities provide expansive panoramic observations of the undersea world in its natural habitat without disturbing the ocean environment. Unsinkable floating sea domes will attract those who prefer unique offshore or island living. In the event of inclement weather, they could easily be towed ashore, mounted, and anchored to elevated support structures. Mariculture and sea farming systems are used to cultivate and raise fish and other forms of marine life to help meet nutritional needs. These marine enclosures are designed as non-contaminating integral parts of the ocean environment. If we use science and technology with human and environmental concerns, it could be a vivid future showcase of the human potential when working together to preserve the greatest gift we have, the resources and beauty of our planet Earth. In the final analysis, we are one people and share one planet. If you desire more information on any of the systems seen in this video, visit our website at www.thevenusproject.com.
these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I'm only a child, yet I know we are all in this together and should act as one single world towards one single goal. We have heard the rationales offered by the superpowers. We know who speaks for the nations. But who speaks for the human species? Who speaks for Earth? I am talking about the resource-based economy. The scientific method for social equality Where our technology allows for life in global abundance And the choice between contender and incumbent is redundant Welcome to this pale blue dot in our galaxy Where we fear the finality of our own mortality And we worry about our salary and consumption of calories While famine and war have caused another fatality We live in a finite world, but our need for growth is infinite Our relationship with money is so damn intimate We can't slow down, we want more, oh we're so into it Intimate? It would be a sin to quit So now the whole planet's in debt We owe quite a tall stack But it's literally impossible to pay it all back Because money is debt created with interest Do you listen? actually more money owed than exists in the whole system. That's a pyramid scheme. Not just mean individuals skimming the cream. Not just smoke-filled rooms with the supremely powerful convene. It seems a systemic flaw is the theme to this meme. Today's system defines who wins and loses with competitions And losers are created by definition Our leaders are ruled by political ambition Not a single one of them is a trained technician It would be insane to listen to their claims I'd rather use the scientific method to arrive at decisions So pardon my sedition, but I stand by my division And I fight against this system with a thought for ammunition It's a train of thought, it's a frame of sorts A campaign where you can't just feign support The train of thought can't be claimed or bought it's an idea, there's no one you can blame in court. It's a train of thought, it's not a game or sport. It pertains to humane and sustained support. Like a chain is wrought, it can be trained from taught to anyone with a brain. Let me explain in short. I'm talking about the resource based economy, the scientific method for social equality. No political borders, no one giving you order. It's the wealth we're giving to our sons and daughters. I'm talking about the resource based economy, the scientific method for social equality. We can only try to fit the mold So instead of growth and jobs, let's set ourselves a new goal A bold, high standard of living for the planet as a whole In a sustainable way for every human soul, young and old Let go of your borders, time to think worldwide No more democracy and politics, all that's been tried Instead, we use the scientific method as a guide To arrive at decisions on how technology is applied And if we want to provide, we can't take a resource and abuse it We need to keep track of what we have and how fast we use it System theory tells us everything in nature is connected When we cut down to many trees the ecosystem is affected So in production it makes sense to build everything to last Planned obsolescence should be a thing of the past And if we design fast evolving technologies to be modular We can replace old parts with a new one more popular To distribute our goods the shortest distance is preferred To transfer from there what we can make here is absurd Then we evaluate demand for goods and build hubs to receive them Like a library where you check things out for as long as you need them All of this is doable with today's technology As long as we apply the right methodology Cause scarcity is technically outdated, you follow me? This way we can live in abundance and global equality. I'm talking about the resource-based economy, the scientific method for social equality, where technology allows a life in global abundance, and the choice between contender and incumbent is redundant. I'm talking about the resource-based economy, the scientific method for social equality, every time the transition is about damn time, the planet is shared by Incentive is the key to understanding volition We don't act without it, it's behind any decision There's no human nature to behavior, just predisposition It has to be supported by the surrounding conditions So the mission is one we should all agree to pick No police, no prisons, no referee to trick Build a system with no incentive for harmful behavior Cause if you remove the carrot, you don't need the stick There would be nothing to gain from trying to mislead Mistreat or deceive, no incentive to leave What could you hope to achieve? Anything you need, you can get for free and it would always be available, so no reason for greed. 10% of the population makes the system run, so instead of working 9 to 5, live your life for fun. Travel the world, raise a family, read a book, build something beautifully useful, or learn to cook. It's this generation's defining challenge, extraordinaire. It's not complicated, just a comprehensive affair. For some it's a big mouthful, for others a breath of fresh air. Don't be scared, cause it can be done, don't despair. It
educate yourself on how the current system's impaired But please do more than just make other people aware When it comes down to it, we have two things to declare One, we all care, and two, we all share That train of thought is a frame of sorts A campaign where you can't just fame support The train of thought can be claimed abort It's an idea, there's no one you can blame in court It's a train of thought, it's not a game of sport It pertains to humane and sustained support Like a chain is brought, it can't be trained and taught to anyone with a brain, let me explain in short I'm talking about the resource-based economy Scientific method for social equality No political borders, no one giving you orders It's a wealth worth giving to our sons and daughters I'm talking about the resource-based economy Scientific method for social equality Take care of the planet and meet everybody's need Make the world get free, just live and let me I'm talking about the resource-based economy Scientific method for social equality You see, the real value of a conflict, the true value, is in the debt that it creates. You control the debt, you control everything. You find this upsetting, yes? But this is the very essence of the banking industry. To make us all, whether we be nations or individuals, slaves to debt. You can't call me money, but you can't escape from me I take race hatefully, enslave and make it fuck for me And luckily, the species ain't seen my diseases I'm plugging the streets with bodies that keep slacking me You casually spin me as I deprive freedom and lives As I push your future aside, you're divided, can't ask why Your progress is nonsense, it's swamped with obsolescence in seconds I take your best shit and wreck it While you stress and caress me, I poison your cities Left you degraded and clueless, disgracefully stupid Neurologically damaged, empathically savage with habits as hazardous as Halliburton's habit You can't avoid my madness as I ravage the planet For useless consumerism I'm abusing your system of associative thought patterns To eradicate plates of earth Before you vacate the space for permanent work We are the money, copyrights, and surrender the resources The cultural and spiritual The sacredness will be consumerized Into our own existence is female You will be consumerized
money, copyright, sincerity, your resources, your cultural and spiritual distinctiveness will be consumerized into our own resistance is female. You will be consumerized. Sasha, and I'd like to tell you about my home, Prison Earth. Prison Earth is a fairly large place. It has hundreds of different prison cells and billions of prisoners. Some of the prison cells are pretty large, some are much smaller. Some are fairly nice, others are horrible. I was born in jail cell R, which isn't the worst cell in the prison, but many would argue that it's not the best one either. Back in the 90s, when I was growing up, Cell R was actually considered to be a pretty dangerous place. Because of that, my father worked hard to move my family and me to cell U, which was considered to be a much better cell at the time. But it wasn't easy to make the move from cell R to cell U, or to go anywhere, in fact. You can't just move freely from one prison cell to another. All prison cells have very strict rules about who can enter and exit each cell and for how long. The walls between each prison cell are strictly patrolled by guards, and it's almost impossible to leave your own cell without granted permission. To be granted permission to leave your cell, you first need to get a small booklet that has your details written on it. It has your name, your date of birth, your inmate number, where you were born, and some other information. Most prisoners can leave their cells by showing this booklet to the guards, but some cannot. For most prisoners, getting out of their own jail cell is the easy part, though. The hard part is entering into a new cell. You see, there is no free or common area in the prison. The entire prison is strictly divided into jail cells, and each cell has its own rules that you have to follow. The booklet that I told you about dictates which cells you can enter and for how long. Since some jail cells are better than others, this means that some prisoners are more privileged than others. In some jail cells, people slave for livable wages and have access to health care and education. In other cells, a lot of people suffer. They slave in awful conditions and barely earn enough to eat. If you're born in a good jail cell, like the ones in Area E or Area A, you might be quite lucky. Not only because you'll have access to health care and some good services, but also because you can leave your jail cell and temporarily enter many other cells just by showing your booklet to the guards. But if you're born in one of the bad prison cells, you're quite unlucky because it will be very difficult for you to leave or to improve that cell. Most likely, you'll be very poor and the prison guards won't let you into the good cells without additional special permission. To get additional special permission, it can be very difficult. Not only do you need to show the guards your booklet, but you also need to show them a special stamp called a visa that you can only get from the authorities. To get this stamp, you either have to have a lot of money or you have to sign into a contract to be a devoted slave for a company in the good jail cell. But that will only happen if you're very skilled. Sometimes you can also perform a ritual called marriage with someone from that jail cell. Once you have the documents and the stamp, the guards can still refuse you entry into their cell if they feel like it. And if you're poor, there's a good chance that you'll get denied. The funny part is that most prisoners don't even realize that they're locked up. Most prisoners don't even try to go into a neighboring cell for longer than they're allowed to. Most don't question the guards or the other prisoners. They just do what they've always done. They work, work, work. They slave their lives away in their designated jail cells. And they only take vacations when they're allowed, only for as long as they're allowed. They might be numb to this prison. They might be quietly existing, working in the system, perhaps drinking, smoking, or taking pills to cope with the lack of meaning in their imprisoned existence. But I hope you're not like that. 
I hope you question and take a step outside, at least with your own mind. I am Zeitgeist. <laughs>